Don't think with any apologies. Um, Gordon will be here shortly. Draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 20th of February are there in your meeting pack from pages 5 to 10. And if members are content that they're accurate, then I will sign them accordingly. Content. Thanks, Peter. Matters arising, just a couple of matters arising. Um, first item is the Terrorist Defenders Bill, pages 13 to 15 of your meeting packet. Last week's meeting, the committee considered a response from the Minister for Justice, um, where uh, it was outlined that the communication which took place on extending the Terrorist Defenders Bill to Northern Ireland and advised that the Minister had written to the Lord Chancellor and the Secretary of State for Justice asking that uh, officials engage with DOJ officials to explore including provisions for Northern Ireland relating to sentencing and early release of terrorist-related offenders in the Counter-Terrorist Bill. The committee agreed to write to the Secretary of State for Justice, indicating that the committee supported the Minister's position and wished to see the same protections provided by the legislation extended to here. Um, the Minister has provided a further update, which indicates that the Ministry for Justice has engaged with her department and officials are currently examining the potential impact, legal and practical implications of draft proposals provided by the Ministry of Justice that set out the scope and potential application of the various provisions within Northern Ireland. The Department will provide a briefing on the scope and potential impact of various provisions as soon as officials have considered the details, so that information is there for noting. I appreciate I'm referring to the Minister in the third person when the Minister is here in front of us, so we're, I'm just going through the formality. I, I suspect this will be one area that members will raise in the course of that uh, session with the Minister. Um, item two is the overview briefing on reducing offending directorate, pages 20 and 21. The Department has written, advising that during the oral evidence session on the reducing offending directorate on the 6th of February, <coughs> members were mistakenly informed by uh, Dr O'Hare that data was not available regarding reoffending rates for the enhanced combination order pilot. That was incorrect. Data is available and indicates that was, there was a reoffending rate of 44.1%, <coughs> which was 41 people reoffending out of the 93. <coughs> so it's just to provide that correction. And the second, or third item from matters arising was the Executive Subcommittee on the EU exit at last week's meeting. The question of how scrutiny work of the Executive Subcommittee on the European Union exit would be undertaken was raised. Terms of reference for the Subcommittee has been placed in the Assembly Library and indicates that its work will be subject by scrutiny of the Assembly Committee for the Executive Office. Um, so there are members as information for noting. Um, item four. Draft letter to the House of Lords EU Committee at our meeting last week. Committee considered an invite from the uh, House of Lords EU Committee to submit views on the negotiations for the UK EU partnership. Agreed a draft response outlining key justice issues should be prepared for consideration at this meeting. A draft response was circulated on Tuesday to members and is in your tabled pack at pages 3 to 5. So it's there for members' uh, endorsement, unless there's any other proposed additions or amendments that members wish to make. It just sets out some of the factual issues without indicating committee positions on it. So if members are content, we will issue that letter as drafted. Content? Agreed. Okay. Item four. Um, delighted to have the Minister for Justice here, Naomi Long, to the meeting, along with your Permanent Secretary, uh, Peter May. Um, we, we welcome this engagement. We know that we've had a briefing from all aspects now of your department. Uh, just a, a couple that we, we still wanted to follow up on, but I thought it was important that we do that before uh, we had an opportunity to meet with you, Minister, and um, I intend very much to try and have a constructive relationship with you. Uh, I know that will be the mind of the committee to do that, notwithstanding th I'm sure there will be issues that we will uh, at times disagree on, but um, as with your predecessor, when I had this role, I always felt it was better to, to try and work things where we had common ground, and I certainly intend to do that as Chair of the Committee with committee support in that. So, uh, delighted you're here and I'm going to hand over to you to give us an overview and then members will have some questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you to the committee um, for the invitation and for your welcome and particularly, I think, for your opening remarks um, in relation um, to cooperative working because I think particularly in the context where this is quite a short mandate, I think close cooperation between the department and the committee is the best way for us to ensure that at the end of the mandate um, we have seen tangible results in terms of delivery of the programme and that we 
want to take forward. So I'm welcoming the opportunity um, to meet with you today and I want to set out what I'm hoping to deliver in this mandate and I hope that we can work together to do that. Much good work has already been done by my predecessors, including work with this committee um, to develop innovative and problem-solving practices to what are largely intractable problems within the justice system. I want to build on that, and in doing so, I want to work in partnership with the committee and with my colleagues across the executive and within the community and voluntary sector. I hope that we can have as a shared commitment in the two years left of the mandate to make a real difference for some of the most vulnerable people who we engage with um, or who are Im impacted by uh, the justice system. I want us to do that um, through developing a focus on person-centred approaches. Approaches where we look at the system and the services we provide through the eyes of the people who are most impacted by crime, the people who are the most vulnerable, the people who usually do not have a voice. I want to ensure that we look at the system through the eyes of the most vulnerable victims and witnesses so that we can, working together, deliver real change in their experience of the system. And so, in order to do that, I want to bring forward a range of measure, measures which I believe will reduce harm for individuals. When complainants, victims and witnesses engage with the justice system, a crime will have already occurred and, to some extent, damage has already been done. But I want to ensure the system does not re-traumatise um, and re-victimise those victims. I want to ensure that the legislative framework meets the needs of victims and that the supports and services we offer are holistic and bespoke. If possible, I want to be able to repair some of that damage done, and I think that it is possible for us to do that. In this mandate, I want to work with the committee to help in five ways um, around victims of domestic and sexual offences in particular. Firstly, um, I want to bring forward legislation through this Assembly as soon as possible to close an important gap for victims of domestic abuse, introducing a new domestic abuse offence to cover abusive behaviour, for example, emotional, controlling, intimidating, humiliating or degrading behaviour, as well as physical or sexual violence. Secondly, I want to establish an advocacy support service for victims of both domestic and sexual violence and abuse, which will ensure a more coordinated and tailored response to their needs. Thirdly, I want to avoid re-traumatisation of victims of sexual violence through the implementation of some of the key Gillen recommendations, which have the potential to transform the experience of vulnerable complainants. Those would include things like, for example, the development of remote evidence centres, identifying how voluntary and public sector organisations in Northern Ireland can work together to provide children with access to justice while avoiding re-traumatisation or re-victimisation of children, as well as providing high professional standards for their recovery. Establishing a framework for pre-recorded cross-examination, potentially starting with young victims of sexual offences, to support them to give evidence ahead of trial in a familiar and a supportive environment. Through committal reform legislation, which will ensure complainants only have to give oral evidence in court on one occasion, um, and I think that that reform will also assist with speeding up the process of justice, another factor which we know impacts negatively on victims' experiences. And also excluding the public from court when evidence in sexual violence cases is being taken. Fourthly, I want to empower vulnerable victims of sexual violence by ensuring that they have the knowledge and advice required to make the right decisions for them and by tackling the cultural issues that exist around sexual violence cases and the role that social media can play in those. And finally, in this section, I also want to bring forward legislation to remove the same household provision so victims of sexual abuse who have previously been denied compensation because of that rule can now receive the compensation they're due. Moving on to vulnerable victims, um, there are a number of other steps that I would want to take. We know the current legislative provisions are not adequate to meet the needs, particularly of victims of stalking, and we know how the justice system responds to such cases can influence the overall effect the crime has on the victim. So I've committed to introduce legislation this year to provide a more effective and appropriate legislative framework. The scale and impact of hate crime in Northern Ireland needs to be tackled. We all know that such crimes have a profound and lasting impact, not just on the individual affected, but also on communities. I want to look at the report of Judge Maranen's review um, of the hate crime legislation and then work to take forward those recommendations which can have the most impact on the experiences of vulnerable hate crime victims um, in the initial phase. I'm also bringing in domestic homicide reviews later this year, which will seek opportunities for learning from tragic cases of homicide resulting from domestic violence and abuse. It is intended that the learning from those reviews will be used to try to prevent future domestic homicides from happening. Turning then to vulnerable communities. 
I think we all know that the causes of crime are complex. There's much research and evidence to show that issues such as poverty, neglect, low self-esteem, low levels of educational attainment, alcohol and drug abuse and misuse can be connected to people's reasons for committing crime. It's vital that we work with others right across the government and in the voluntary and community sector to prevent crime from occurring in the first place by intervening earlier as we seek to address the societal issues upstream through restorative approaches and as we seek to repair the damage um, through a more holistic approach to community safety to ensure that the justice response is, is joined up and working collaboratively and making a difference for people and places impacted by crime. We also know that some people and some communities are disproportionately affected by crime and criminality. The devastating impact that coercive control can have on communities and the importance of living within communities where there is confidence in the rule of law and respect for each other, I think, are obvious to us all. Some communities still live in fear, and this detracts heavily from their confidence in the justice system and impacts on our work to support the creation of shared communities. It's vital that we take a cross-departmental um, approach and work across central and local government and in the community and voluntary sector to take forward the Tackling Paramilitarism programme. We also need to continue to embed a culture of lawfulness to robustly and consistently ch challenge any perceived legitimacy around, for example, <coughs> paramilitary-style attacks, <coughs> to work with communities to stop people, especially young people, from getting involved in the first place and to bring to justice those who continue to wreak havoc within communities. And I will work to ensure that criminals don't enjoy the benefits of their ill-gotten gains by working to bring forward um, and then force the Criminal Finance Act, including unexplained wealth orders, by the end of this year. One of the ways that the justice system can support vulnerable communities is through having strong neighbourhood policing teams. And you'll know that the Chief Constable has advocated an increase in police numbers, which form part of the New Decade New Approach document. The speed with which that can be implemented is highly dependent on the budget, but I do want to ensure in this mandate that we secure an increase from current levels um, so that we are moving in the right direction. Turning then to our work with those who are already within the justice system, a very important part of reducing the number of victims is working to tackle the root causes of offending and to support those released from our care to integrate back into society. The reality is that most of those who offend um, return to our community when their sentence is complete, and so it's vital that we work with them while they're in our care, challenging and supporting them to change offending behaviour. We shouldn't underestimate the challenges that are faced by prison staff. Those who offend often have a range of complex needs, um, and often by the time they reach the justice system, everything else has failed, and that is why they've ended up in custody. But if we want a safer community with less crime and fewer victims, then investing in helping people to stop offending while they're in custody is both necessary and important. I was delighted recently to visit Davis House at McGabry, um, which was work started by David Ford, and which now enables prison service to take rehabilitation work in that facility to a new level. I'm therefore committed to building on the early intervention and problem-solving approaches which have been pioneered by my predecessors, including work taken forward with the previous Justice Committee. I will be seeking to develop further successful problem-solving justice pilots and to build on the rehabilitative work undertaken by prison service. I have commissioned work to scope how we might better support those with addictions who find themselves in our prisons, and I want to work with the Minister uh, for Health to improve health, particularly mental health, um, among those who come in contact with the justice system, and particularly those who are placed in our care by the courts. We will continue our work with the Department of Health also to transform existing facilities at Woodlands and Lakewood into a multi-purpose secure care and justice campus delivering intensive support for vulnerable children with complex needs, including mental health needs, substance misuse and behavioural issues. And I'm also determined to keep a focus on our work to support people as they transition from custody back to the community through strengthening family relationships, enhancing the education skills and employability provision that's offered within the system, and also by ensuring that the accommodation and health needs of those leaving prison are uh, appropriately met. Turning finally then to the criminal justice system itself. An effective justice system is important for the victims of crime, for those who have offended, for those who need to resolve civil and family disputes, and also for the general community to have confidence in the system. 
The speed the cases progress through the system matters to everyone in that chain. And so within this mandate, I want to work with partners on the Criminal Justice Board to tackle avoidable delay. I will bring forward a new committal reform bill, as already mentioned, which will help to reduce the time taken for cases to be completed. A further example um, of we're working to ensure that the system works for and doesn't re-traumatise vulnerable people. Looking at the facilities that we provide, in addition to the Secure Children's Campus due for completion in 2020, um, I'm going to, throughout this mandate, continue with the modernisation of the courts and present estate in order to ensure that our facilities better meet the needs of service users and also the staff who work in them. I'm also considering whether the time is right to take stock of the policing oversight arrangements. Bearing in mind that it is now 20 years from the major policing reforms were implemented um, through patent and 10 years since justice was devolved, it seems sensible to look at whether any enhancements to these arrangements are needed now to ensure that the vision of the patent report continues to be delivered and delivered seamlessly. I've not yet consolidated my thinking on this, but I will ensure that the committee <coughs> and the other key stakeholders are kept informed um, of any decisions in that respect. I've no doubt that the committee would join with me in acknowledging also the vital work undertaken by frontline staff within the justice system. Their work is complex, challenging and often dangerous, and so I want to pay tribute to them for the work they do and the sacrifices they make. Since before taking office, it had become clear to me that there is a disparity in the support available to retired police officers and the provision in place for former prison officers. In view of this, I've commissioned an urgent review to advise me on how we can ensure better equivalence. The review will examine the current provision of services to former prison officers and identify whether and if so what additional service provision would be appropriate and propose a costed approach for delivery. The review will report to me by the 30th of June 2020, following which I will decide how best to proceed. In commissioning the review, it is important to note that the department does not currently have funding available for this work, and so I will want to work with executive colleagues and with the Northern Ireland Office in relation to legacy issues to ensure that funding is made available to address what is, uh, that I can address what is a very significant need. So in conclusion, um, it is a big agenda. There are some difficult decisions which will need to be made about priorities and how we use the departmental resources available to us. Also, I think that there will be issues that will arise throughout the course of the mandate that are as yet beyond our control and demands that will be made on the department um, over which we have only limited control, things like Brexit, um, emerging priorities um, from the UK government and legacy. I think it will require us to work together with many partners in other departments, this committee and beyond in order to deliver. I recognise and want to support the important scrutiny role of the committee and I hope that today I've set out some major initiatives that we can work together and deliver over the next two years. Inevitably, we will not always agree, but if we have a clear vision of what we're trying to achieve, that will surely help us navigate any challenges and then look for pragmatic solutions. In the next two years, I think together we can ensure that vulnerable victims are better supported in their journey through the justice system the people who offend and who have complex needs are helped and challenged to resolve their issues, their addictions and their offending behaviour. The people who are at risk of offending are encouraged away from that path before they find themselves in the justice system. The communities are better supported and empowered to be safe and resilient and that our justice system is better at meeting the needs of those who engage with it. The outcome here is a safer community, less crime and fewer victims. I think that that's an outcome on which we will all be agreed, and I look forward to working with you in delivering it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, and you've certainly laid out a, a very ambitious plan for the next two years, uh, and I've no doubt the committee will, will want to look at all of that um, as part of our scrutiny role. Uh, I, I don't intend to make elaborate comments, because I would rather just get a good engagement around some of the information. Um, so I, I'll hopefully set an example and then I'll open it up to, to some members. In terms of the, the budget position, obviously with your policy objectives in mind, the committee has been advised that you're looking at for standing still in the next financial year on your current baseline, it's just over £60 million um, is, is what is needed. Have you had your bilateral yet with the finance minister and is there any indication of progress being made in, in getting the resources that you need? 
Well, the figures that you've quoted obviously are correct, um, and it will be a challenging environment potentially for us. As you know, the decisions are being taken around the budget. Um, the Finance Minister has announced this week the intention to delay the budget so that we can take account um, of the budget in Westminster. The timing of this is far from ideal, as you will appreciate, not all of it in our gift. Um, our return after a hiatus of a period um, in January did make preparation for this more difficult, but more importantly, the fact that the UK government went through um, I kind of went through the general election at a time when normally we would have had the autumn statement and other indications of direction of travel um, has also meant that we don't have a huge amount of foresight of, of where the government might be headed with the budget. So I think that was a wise decision in terms of ensuring that we don't um, project on the basis of what could be artificially low figures. However, I think we also recognise that where there are announcements in the budget, they're more likely to affect capital than revenue significantly, so we need to be realistic about that. So it will be a challenging environment um, financially. I've had my bilateral um, with the Finance Minister. Um, it is my view, and I've communicated that to colleagues in the Executive, that whilst the budget itself will not be able to be finalised until we know uh, what the Barnet consequentials of the budget um, in Westminster are, that we should plan on the basis um, of a slightly, if you like, the budget that we have at the moment, in order that we all prioritise um, the, the things that we want to do, not just within the department, but actually also prioritise the department's asks against other departments' demands, um, because we need to be realistic about that. With respect to the budget, I think it would be fair to say that over the years, um, the department's budget has reduced significantly. It's been an 11%, I think an 11% reduction since 2010-2011. That's not sustainable in terms of future direction of travel. Um, I think the department has shown itself also willing to make the kind of reform that's necessary to make sure that finances are well managed. So, for example, you'll be aware um, of the legal aid reforms that took place um, in the last term. Um, you'll also be aware of the work that's been done, for example, to ensure that some of the services that are provided become, if you like, self-financing so that, that they're actually reco covering, recovering costs. So I think that all of that work is done to make sure that any money that we get is spent on the right things. And I would also have to say that balanced against all of that is the fact that such a large chunk of the department's budget goes directly to frontline service provision, so around 70% to the police and then within the remaining amount, a large amount to prison service and to other direct services. So it's only around 5% of the budget that actually remains in the department in terms of management, if you like. So there aren't opportunities there um, really to be able um, to get any more efficiency um, out of the, the structures of the department. Beyond, beyond the resource, if we can ask you just on the capital side, um, because if there is a significant uplift in infrastructure, um, which is all the indications are from, from London, um, the, the capital bids around the police estate and the prison estate, the court estate, is there an ambitious bid that is going in for increased capital spend? There are a number of um, capital projects that, as you know, are under development. So there is the co the, the estates uh, project for the courts and tribunal service. Like that's quite an important one um, because I know that some members have already been asking questions around, for example, the use of courthouses for here and benefit appeals and the impact that that can have as to whether or not those um, all of those courthouses are entirely suitable for that use. Um, and I think that there's a piece of work that can be done there to make courthouses more accessible and to recognise that they are also used not just for criminal issues, but for family and justice and indeed other um, civil matters. So I think that there's there's a piece of work can be done there to make those more accessible and suitable. There is, as you know, also um, a requirement in terms of the prison service and the plans that have been developed um, in terms of McGilligan, which is in a poor state um, and needs considerable rebuild, um, and also um, the need for a women's prison. So those are a few examples. In respect of the police, I've been briefed about the police's ambition to reorganise their estate. Obviously, it's for them to discuss that with the policing board and to go through their internal mechanisms and then bring those 
those bids for funding to me and, and then on through the system. Um, but I think that there are sufficiently ambitious projects that if there is money available in capital, we would not find that difficult um, to spend, nor would it be misspent. And I think one of the key um, arguments that we can make is if you look at the case of Davis House, I mean, it was an infrastructure project brought in on time and on budget. Um, and given some of the criticism there's been of other um, infrastructure projects, I think what the prison service certainly has shown and what the department has demonstrated is that where we get capital, we can spend it and spend it efficiently and effectively and produce good outcomes. Okay. A couple of just policy areas I wanted to touch on. Um, the Assembly had passed human trafficking legislation that was touched on um, last week around the modern slavery aspect of it. Um, within that, there was a review of an uh, aspects of that, um, and without going into a lot of the policy-related issues to do with supporting victims of human trafficking and so on, I suppose I just want to ask you a question on uh, any intention to review the legislation that was passed um, by the department uh, on the back of some of the reviews that have already been carried out. I have no intention to review or repeal the legislation. I actually met with Lord Morrow um, last week, um, along with a couple of his colleagues, and we had this discussion. Um, it wouldn't be my intention. It's not a priority. Um, I don't believe that the legislation being on the books, regardless of what people's view of its efficacy might be, um, is detrimental to be able to get on with the work that needs to be done. So it would not be a priority for me in this mandate. Um, and so hopefully those who were concerned that that might be the case, I'll be rest assured that that's not at the top of, of my list. Okay, I appreciate that. I welcome the urgent review and to support for ex-prison officers. My father was a prison officer for some 36 years, um, as were other family members. Um, and it's an issue that has been raised by me, by, by people, um, particularly when they've left the service. The issues around PTSD and, and that kind of strain, when they've lost their, their colleagues, um, then these issues have often impacted upon them. So if I can just clarify, the urgent review is due to complete by June of this year um, and an equivalent kind of support that we look at is around the PRRT facilities for the police service. I know the prison service get limited <coughs> opportunity to avail of that. Is that the kind of support package that is being considered? Well, obviously the review will look at what's there at the moment. Um, so it will look at the landscape that we already have. And I know that there are a number of organisations that provide different levels of support both to prison officers and also to widows um, of prison officers. Um, then there's the opportunity, I think, for us to look mm -hmm. at what is provided for the police. So PRRT would be one of those um, in terms of support. But you're, you're right. And I think there are perhaps two elements of this. I mean, first of all, there are those who served in the times which you refer to. Um, and there are those who still serve in very difficult circumstances um, where they face threats, intimidation, um, and indeed their families face threats and intimidation. Um, and we're aware of the risk that they place themselves at in terms of the service um, that they provide. And often when people retire, it, that's the point where, if you like, the trauma really hits in with people. So we want to make sure that we scope out the extent to which that is a problem and the, the kind of numbers of people who would be seeking to use the service so that we can, I guess, get a grip on... Because at the moment, because there is no service, we actually don't know how many people would require it. So what we're trying to do is scope out the kind of volume of, of demand that there would be, the kind of issues um, that people are dealing with and the kind of support that they would require, and then look at whether um, access to an existing service um, provided or whether a bespoke service um, is the best way forward. I mean, I recognise that even today, even officers who are working, um, for example, not with organised crime or terrorist offenders and others can still face quite traumatic circumstances um, and will witness and see things within the prison system uh, that can be quite traumatising. Um, we know that, for example, deaths in custody have a huge impact um, on not just other prisoners, but also on the prison officers who often have to be the first responder in those circumstances. And so it's appropriate that we provide people with the right support in their job and as they're doing their job 
but it's also important that we look to see that we have the correct provision for those who have retired out of the service for whatever reason um, and that they're not left without the necessary support going forward given that they have given service to the community in the way that they have. I have been hugely impressed um, on my visits um, to McGabry and this morning actually to High Bank Wood um, at the work that is being done by the prison service and I don't think it is always fully appreciated um, just how diverse um, and complex that work is. Um, but I have been hugely impressed with just the talent um, and the initiative that's being shown um, with officers who are genuinely committed um, to rehabilitation, to working with prisoners um, and to keeping them safe. And I think it's it would be wrong of us as a society not to provide properly um, for their care, but I will need cooperation. Mm -hmm. Um, from executive colleagues and others and hopefully those of you who have been writing to me about it um, and questioning about it will be able to talk to your colleagues about the need for this to happen and I would imagine that a large part of the cooperation will come from people like health and education um, because it's often that kind of support that's needed for somebody after they've left the service in order that they can um, go on and, and build a new career and a new life but also have the kind of support that they need health wise. I, I certainly agree with all of that and welcome your, your comments comments. Um, often those that serve in the prison service feel it's a hidden service. Um, police officers are very much under pressure. However, the public can see that and can come alongside and give them support. People don't see prison officers unless you're in the prison yeah. uh, and, and therefore they don't get the same community support necessarily from those that are supportive of what they do and, and their family still have to say, oh my father or mother are you know, uh, involved in insurance or still don't have the, the confidence to tell people actually the job that they do do. And that brings in itself a dynamic you know, that those families need to manage. So I welcome all of that. Finally, and then I'll bring in other members, uh, just your, your view on the uh, applications to the police service in terms of the figures that were published yesterday, nearly 7,000 applicants. You'll have seen the breakdown of, of the figures. I, I look forward to the day when we don't need to have a breakdown of Protestant, Catholic, other, male, female, um, but nevertheless it's the world that we're in right now. Um, I would just welcome your, your comments on what your views are around the recruitment process. Well, first of all, um, I think that the level of cross-party support and political support that there was for this recruitment was very welcome, um, because I think it took place in what could only be described as quite challenging circumstances, given some of the conduct of others trying to dissuade people from engaging with the recruitment process and, um, and joining the police. I think that the fact that the numbers are so strong is a very good indicator that we will get out of this recruitment uh, a very talented group of people who are committed to serving the community. And I agree with you, it is a shame um, that we still have to measure these issues, but I think in terms of community confidence, it's also important that we can demonstrate um, that we have a diverse um, and reflective um, police service. And I think it's important for community confidence and for people to have um, to, to feel that the police reflect um, them as much as anyone else. I think that's a huge part of being able to work with communities and in communities to be able to deliver effective policing. But I think it's a heartening um, start, if you like, to the, the, the recruitment process. Um, and I think credit to all of those um, who encourage people in their communities to come forward. Um, and to all of those who applied, some of whom will be successful and some of whom will not. But I would want to thank all of those who have put their applications forward because I do believe that it's a valuable role that they've applied to do. I think that if you want to serve your community and make a real difference, it's hard to think of something that will make a real difference to the community than making people feel safe. Um, and that is what the police are engaged in doing day and daily. So I think it's, it's a positive start um, to the campaign and I hope that it will lead to um, the police being able to recruit um, some really good new officers um, and continue to deliver good results in communities. In terms of the, the final selection of the, the successful recruits at the launch of the recruitment campaign, um, they indicated that there was a disproportionate dropout level um, from people from the Catholic community. Um, and there's been reports as to underlying reasons as to why people haven't felt confident to come forward from that community to apply. Um, I know the police indicated they've been addressing issues throughout this next stage to try and, and deal with some of the issues that have been highlighted as to why there had been this disproportionate drop-off um, when it came to the final 
selection of the pool because you would anticipate uh, it'll be reasonably reflective of the number of applicants in terms of the pool that's available now coming through at the end. Um, so in addressing those underlying issues about greater community support for people from within the Catholic community to join um, and addressing those issues, uh, I know that you have said that you're up for the conversation if it ever became necessary as a last resort to look at the 50-50, for example, coming back in. Is that still the, posi the position that you hold, that you would want to have that conversation? Um, and is that something that you feel could be necessary uh, in light of the, the recent figures? Well, it's not a conversation that I would want to have. What I would want to have um, is a pool of applicants that ensure that we do have a reflective police service without having um, to artificially manufacture that, because I believe that that's a much healthier situation to be in. Um, I'm not a fan of 50-50 personally, as you will be well aware, um, and it's not something that I would particularly lean towards. I think it's a very blunt tool. I think it has unintended consequences in terms of confidence in other parts of the community, which is unhelpful. Um, however, as Minister, I have to be willing to listen to the advice and the guidance that's provided at the appropriate time and to have those discussions. Given the, the lack of general political support for it and given that it is a cross-cutting and controversial issue, it would be a matter for the executive to decide, not for me solely to decide. But I would want to have that conversation with colleagues on the basis of evidence. And so for me, I believe that the best way to overcome disparities is to look at whether it's as a result of discrimination, uh, whether that is direct or indirect discrimination, but also to look whether there are simply barriers, societal or otherwise, that are in place that can be tackled as a first way of trying to increase um, the representation and make it more balanced. It's not also just about Protestant and Catholic. Um, it's also about women in the police service. It's about people from the LGBT community. It's about people with disabilities who can serve in the police service. It's also about people from ethnic minority backgrounds um, who are underrepresented and a whole host of other groups. I think everybody wants to reach the same end point, and that is that when they look at the police service, they see a service that reflects the community around them. They see a service in which they could see themselves reflected, um, and therefore they have confidence that they're dealing with people who reflect the community. And I believe that, if you like, the last resort of 50-50 is very much exactly that. I think it also needs to be borne in mind that 50-50 may have been effective at one time, but it was part of a suite of measures that were put in place, including um, early retirement schemes and other things that accelerated change in the police service in a particular set of circumstances. It would not necessarily have the same impact in terms of the overall proportions of people in the police service were it to be applied as a standalone, um, as a standalone measure. But I think we need to look at the barriers. I think community support is crucial. And not just community support to encourage people to come forward, but also community support that will allow those people, when they become police officers, to remain members of that community. Because I think, unfortunately, the pattern has been that when people have joined the police, um, due to either perceived or real threats and intimidation, people have often felt that they have to leave the community they live in. And that has led to an underrepresentation of people, not just from a Catholic background, but also in many occasions from a working class background, who don't feel that they can join the police and continue to live in their communities because they may see that there is a perceived threat there from other paramilitary organisations or whatever it might be. So I think it's important that police officers can continue to live and be part of the community because I think that's what builds confidence in community policing, that you're being policed by people who understand and live in your community, understand how the, the kind of circumstances that the people they're policing with and for um, are in and are able to provide that, um, that, that point of contact. So I think that there's still a lot of work to be done in society, which is why I think that the work that the police have done in terms of actually going out actively looking for diversity in terms of the intake, but also the work that's been done at a political level in terms of supporting people to come forward um, is absolutely crucial. But undoubtedly, it is a difficult decision, and as you rightly say, people don't only consider themselves, but will also consider their families, and often there can be a high attrition rate simply where people apply think they might want to be in the police, but as the realism dawns um, as, as to what that might entail for them, they decide that on balance it's not a decision that they want to continue with and I think we need to look at that really carefully and say how do we better support people 
to remain in that process and also remain in the police service when they join so that we do have a fair and balanced police service um, but that it's one that is able to do that organically um, rather than through some mechanism that we have to that we have to apply. Again, I, I agree with everything with the, the just the, the last resort being an option in terms of your, your views as to how we go about getting a representative police uh, service for Northern Ireland. Um, I, I just think that keeping the last resort uh, on the table just sends out the wrong message. But you'll understand that as Minister, I, if I take the last resort off the table, um, that also causes significant problems because people would see that as a political decision not taken in light of the evidence. Um, and it's important that I remain, if you like, open-minded. Um, if people can come with a strong evidential case as to why it's necessary or would work. And so I have to leave it on the table because it's there already. Um, but what I'm saying very clearly is that I believe that there are many things that we can do short of that that will have potentially greater impact. And it's important that we work together to try and ensure that we do everything else because that does have unintended consequences and indeed may not be as effective as it might have been in the past. Um, given the circumstances in which it's being applied. Well, as you pointed out, it's cross-cutting, it's controversial and would require that cross-community support for the DUP's position. We didn't uh, support it when it was first introduced as a result of patent and we'd certainly not support it if it ever did come forward. I don't think, um, listening to what you're saying, it is going to come forward, um, but if it ever did, it's not something that will, will get the cross-community support that I, I think... Um, people obviously well, I think it was one of the necessary. few areas, Chairman, on Patton, where yourselves and ourselves agreed yeah. at a party political level. Yeah. Um, but as Minister, as I said, um, it's on the table. It's one of a suite of options. Um, I can't unilaterally take it off the table without giving due consideration um, to the evidence. Um, but as I say, I think it would be a backward step mm. in many ways, um, given that we have been able to move away from that position to then feel that we had to move back. And I think that what society needs is for us to be always moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I would like to think that we we're able to do that um, and to maintain the progress that we've had to date. But nevertheless, it is crucial that the police service is representative of the whole community, because that's crucial not just in terms of support for the police, but in terms of confidence in the justice system more widely. Um, and I think that we can't we can't jeopardise that either. So it's hugely important that we work together um, on a cross-party basis to ensure that that's the case. Well, I, I would uh, I agree with that, but I would say it, it's equally applicable across all public sector, from senior permanent secretaries to the housing executive, and I could quote all of these different public bodies, and I would never argue that there should be a form of legalised sectarian discrimination when it comes to recruitment into those posts, so I don't think it should be the case for the police. I'm going to bring in the Vice Chair of the Committee now, Linda Dillon. Obviously I don't hold the same view. I don't want to take up the whole meeting with it, but um, I think probably to say that given that it was something that we could move away from is not right, because it was something we thought we were forced to move away from, but I'm not going to go down the road of keeping us on this. We've already made your points, and I think that's fair enough. Um, I have a number of, of issues that I suppose I want to raise, and obviously you've, you've already outlined what your, your own priorities are. In terms of, I suppose, the legacy, first of all, and... There, were, there are two elements to this. Obviously, we have the inquest process, and it's just a reassurance that you know, resourcing in order for the LCJ to be allowed to or enabled to carry this process through and, and be able to, I suppose, fulfil the expectations of the, the families involved, that resourcing will be um, continued for that. And then around the Ombudsman's office and the HAU, which hopefully will come. Um, I suppose, just in terms of, of your own perspective what your your view is around the HAU and if it's something that you would see as being beneficial in the terms of the overall justice brief. I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that and like then I can ask then sure. I, I don't want to Everything on the no, well, I mean, first of all, um, I acknowledge that there are a range of views on 5050, which is one of the reasons why I said it would have to be discussed, I think, at executive um, if we got to that point. And I also think that as it has to be done in light of the evidence. So that 
th that's my position on that one. In terms of a legacy, yes, it is a very challenging area, um, and undoubtedly it's one of the ones that is outside our direct control to some degree. Um, the legislation, as you know, is part of the new decade, new approach. Um, in 100 days, we were meant to see the legislation um, be brought forward um, on the HIU and the Stormont House Agreement um, structures. Um, I think I said in the chamber when I was asked about this during my initial session of questions that for me, I think that like all of the legacy pieces, um, the Stormont House Agreement is imperfect. But I don't think we can allow perfect to become the enemy of the good. And I think that if we don't go down the route of having some kind of comprehensive approach on legacy, and if we don't do it at this point in time, then we need to be candid with victims that it is unlikely that there will be another opportunity to do it. And I think that that applies both to the legislation and structures and also to the resource. And I think the resource question is one that has not yet been answered um, in terms of the UK government. The estimate, for example, for the HIU alone is um, £300 to £400 million pounds over 10 years. Initially, there was an indication from the NIO that the UK government would um, allocate £150 million pounds to the HIU. Um, and they've then added a subsequent 100 million to that, so that's 250 million out of three to 400 million ask. That's for the HIU alone. That doesn't take account of the other legacy costs. And as you're aware, you mentioned the ombudsman. Not all of the ombudsman cases would, would transfer to the HIU um, because some of those um, would remain as ombudsman cases about police misconduct as opposed to investigations of deaths um, in the Troubles. There's also an increase in burden in terms of the police service um, and their budgets in terms of um, legacy litigation where people are taking cases against the police um, directly to the courts and that's a growing issue um, and one that is unpredictable in terms of the scale of that to some degree and um, that we have put a bid through um, to the Department of Finance to try to accommodate at least some of that additional cost um, in policing. The big issue here is that as we stand at the moment it is not a choice between Stormont House and something better. It is the choice between Stormont House and nothing at all because there is no capacity left in the system to continue to deal with legacy as it stands. The current system is completely broken um, in terms of being able to take things forward. It is at capacity. So, for example, the John Boucher approach, um, and that has been working well for, for the families that have access to that. Um, there are no investigators um, from other police services that can be brought in at this stage with the kind of experience um, at investigative level that would be able to supplement that for new cases to come forward. So the limitations there are, are of capacity, so there's no further capacity there. Um, we're awaiting, obviously, court judgments with respect to the role that former police officers um, and police officers can play in investigations. And that will, again, shape resource that's available for the HIU and, indeed, for, for anything else. But in the interim, the police, with the HET, haven't been wound up, don't have the, the ability to be able to look at anything further. And Article 2 compliance also raises issues. So that puts a, a limit on that. Um, and so everything that is done that is legacy related is essentially, at this stage, taking resource away from current policing priorities and that's unavoidable that is true in my conversations with the ombudsman's office where their balance between legacy and current policing um, is it's a direct it's a direct competition for resource um, and it is true with policing that the more money that needs to be invested in legacy well it's coming from direct policing so from frontline policing so i think that there's a challenge in terms of getting the structures in place that deal with legacy and getting them funded. I think we need to be realistic um, about people's expectations in terms of what those structures can deliver, um, because the more remote we are from the events that occurred, the harder it will be to secure um, you know, information that hasn't previously been available and so on. 
But I do fundamentally believe that victims have a right to be able to seek justice. Um, I think that it would be wrong, and I don't think it would add to confidence in the current justice system where people to be told <clears throat> that their historic cases can't be properly considered um, and investigated. I also think that there would be, if you like, a conflict with the approach that's taken with other historic serious crime. So, for example, in cases, historic cases of child abuse, um, people are investigated, um, regardless of the age of um, the alleged perpetrator. Investigations are taken forward. People are brought to court um, and tried for those offences, and indeed were appropriate, convicted and sentenced for them. And so I think it would be the wrong message to send out that whilst we would pursue one kind of crime, we would ignore another kind of crime. Um, so I think that the answer to this is to try to get the structures in place and then to continue the conversations with the UK government about the funding um, of the legacy piece. In terms of the inquests, um, the, the arrangements around that obviously preceded my time in office. But I know that the kind of first tranche um, of inquests are ongoing and money was set aside in order to ensure that that process could be completed. It was a, it was a time bound and kind of there was a financial limit placed on that um, in order that those cases could be dealt with. Um, but Peter, maybe you want to add a little bit with respect to the progress on the inquest cases? So on, on inquests, this year we've commenced, the, the, the courts have commenced a number of inquests and funding has been made available for that. Um, we are assuming that funding will be baselined. Um, next year we will need some additional money because this year was a kind of start-up year um, and that is something that will be subject to the wider budget considerations that need to be worked through. But we started on the basis that this was a five-year enterprise that needed to be carried right through. Uh, so it is our... It continues to be our um, plan that that is the way in which it will proceed, but, but we don't yet have a budget settlement to be able to give you certainty on that. Okay, I appreciate that. And I suppose just in terms of, of what you've outlined around the HAU, for me, that is as important as anything else in relation to the PSNA recruitment process, because as long as legacy is with the PSNA, and, and the PSNA have said this themselves, it's not something that's coming from Sinn Féin. Two chief constables now have said it, and they've put it in their consultation response, that as long as legacy is with them, that's going to create a toxicity that makes it impossible for them to recruit from certain sections of our community. And whether the disclosure process is because of legal advice they're getting, whether it's ill judged or whether there is intentional obstruction of disclosure, doesn't matter whether it's intentional or unintentional because the perception is that it's intentional. So, and, and you won't convince families around that. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a pointless argument to say that that they will do it and they will do it to their best best of their ability. Quite certain many of them will. But that's not going to take away the perception from the families and that then has the knock on effect and creates the issue around around the, the I would I would completely agree in terms of the impact that um, legacy has in terms of current policing. And I think I mean I mentioned the if you like the resource implications, but you're also correct to say that it has an issue it has there's an issue around confidence as well, because I think if legacy issues are not dealt with well, but also if legacy issues um, are continued to be processed by the current system. It, the findings of something that happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, in respect of that, can colour people's view of the police service as is now. And that can be very unhelpful in terms of not giving due recognition to the massive changes that have been made. Um, and also, I think that there is, a, there is a difficulty then in terms of confidence if people feel that those issues are not being dealt with, then there's a confidence in the current system, which is why I think it is so important that we don't simply, as people have said in the past, draw a line under it and move on. I mean, I understand why people think that that is, if you like, a, an easier solution, but I don't believe that it builds confidence, not just in policing, but actually in the wider justice system if we go down that road. And I think that we need to recognise that nothing we do will be perfect and nothing we do can repair the damage that's been done. But I think there are things we can do that can try to rebuild community confidence in the justice system um, and can at least try to bring some, some closure um, and some help to people if, if only in the people get an understanding of the truth or the circumstances 
or clarity as to why that can't be provided. And I think that even that sometimes is enough for people that they know that someone has tried and genuinely tried. So I think that's absolutely correct. And I think it's important that we try to find structures there that, that allow the police to get on with police in the current circumstances um, and allow legacy to be dealt with, as I believe it should be, as a separate piece of work. And I agree with, with all of what you're saying. Just the other two issues that I wanted to raise with you, Minister, around the stalking legislation. I know you've already said that that, that will be coming forward. I suppose there there is a bit of a campaign building up there and it's, it's just supposed to get a, a, a wee bit of um, confirmation around the timeline for that. And the other issue, and it was raised in, in Matters Horizon, is around the terrorist offences bill. I'm a wee bit concerned just about the, I suppose this, you know, we should have it extended to here. It was brought in without any consultation across the water and as far as I'm aware there's been no consultation here either with the judiciary or the judicial process, with the PSNA or with the prison service and probably for me the prison service is the one that's going to be most impacted outside of those obviously who will who will um who will be the people who will be in prison. And then just to ask you, is it going to be retrospective? Because as far as I'm aware, across the water it is retrospective. So is, would that be the, the same here? Because again I would have concerns and particularly again around how the prison service would work with that. Yeah. And why have they not why are we not allowed at least for a conversation and a consultation with those organisations before we would decide that this would be good legislation for here because we even talked about the domestic abuse legislation and I want to see it coming forward quick but I want to see it right and I think no matter what legislation we're bringing forward as quickly as possible but not at the expense of it being the right legislation because the right, the right tools are more important than having something the wrong tools quickly. Well, I think there's a couple of things. I'll start with the easier one, which is stalking um, and, and the legislation around that. Um, we decided to bring it forward as a separate bill for well, for two reasons. One, I think the, there is a little bit more policy development um, and scoping that needed to be done in order to get it to a stage of readiness where we were, we were good to go. And I don't think it would have been helpful to hold back um, the domestic abuse bill. Um, in order to combine the two into one bill. The other issue for me is that not all stalking is domestic related. And so we wanted to make sure that in the framing of the bill, it was kept as a separate piece of legislation so that those who are stalked as a result of um, domestic abuse, personal relationships or so on, still have access to that, but that others who might be stalked for other, uh, by, by other strangers or whatever it might be, recognise that this is still legislation that's available for them to utilise in terms of, of protecting themselves. Um, the hope would be that we would be able to bring this forward in the autumn. Um, so it would be the intention is that that would be the sort of timeline that we're working towards. Um, and as I said, the intention then would be that it would introduce a specific offence of stalking, but also that it would allow for stalking protection uh, orders to be introduced. And the key there is that at the moment, if someone is stalked, they have to use the legislation around harassment, for example. It can be quite difficult um, to secure a conviction around harassment because often when somebody is being stalked, the individual um, actions that are taken, the individual incidents themselves, fall below the threshold that would qualify as harassment under the current law. But it's the pattern um, and the repetition um, of the behaviour um, that constitutes stalking. And so it can be very difficult in terms of the current law for people to be able to be protected um, adequately. But also, um, people need to go to court to get a non-molestation order. And that can be a financial barrier to people um, not being able to afford to do that and not being able to seek that protection. With stalking protection orders, it's the police who seek the order, um, not the person who's being stalked. And so that relieves them of the financial burden of having to go to court um, in order to seek um, a protection order. And so we think that both of those respond to what we have heard from victims directly um, around um, stalking and where they found the biggest challenges 
were when they went to try to report um, and get response to the, the circumstances that they had faced. With respect to the terrorist-related um, offences and what has happened in England and Wales and indeed in GB more widely, the, the bill, as you know, the emergency provisions that were brought in were brought in for a very specific purpose. There was an operational imperative um, that drove that in England and Wales um, that didn't apply in the Northern Ireland context. There was discussion with the Department of Justice officials, as I said out before, but in the end, the decision not to include um, the Justice Department in that legislation um, was not ours. Some of the issues that we raised um, during that conversation, which didn't preclude Northern Ireland from being included, um, were that retrospectivity would be difficult um, within the Northern Ireland justice context um, and that there would be particular difficulties around how that would be implemented. I think that we, as you know, they're now bringing forward the um, counter-terrorist sentencing and release bill further down the line. So there's an, that's going to be in, I think, March. Towards the end of yeah, March. Yeah, towards the end of March. So the, I think the thinking is that they, that will, if you like, set the final position on this. So to be clear, the, the emergency legislation, um, the provisions in that may, may be changed by the final legislation. We're, that's not clear. So that might change. But it also might then encompass um, a wider provision in terms of Northern Ireland. But we have been clear in our engagement uh, with the Ministry of Justice that it's important that they engage with the department's officials and look at the particular issues and circumstances in Northern Ireland, how that would be managed and implemented, because it needs to be operable um, in the Northern Ireland context, um, and it can't be something that won't work. Um, there's no point having um, changes made to that. It's also important to say, though, that we can't have a situation where Northern Ireland terrorism is treated as though it is a different kind of animal um, because it happens here, because it is not inconceivable that if we're not included in those bills that exactly the same kind of events that have taken place um, in parts of England could take place in Northern Ireland um, and that we would, if you like, be seen to be out of step uh, with the public protection that's put in place. The other thing to say is that people in Northern Ireland who um, are guilty, for example, of murder here uh, as one of the kind of terrorist offences, someone who is serving a life sentence already goes through quite a detailed um, process in terms of assessment before release anyway. It's not an automatic right of release. So people have to apply to the parole commissioners and their, their level of threat be assessed and all of those other things. So it's not quite as straightforward. I wouldn't want people to think that in some way there's been a huge gap created in this. I think this was to do with essentially a single individual who was likely to come up for release in that period of time before the final legislation comes through that they were particularly worried about, um, as opposed to a driver for massive policy change otherwise. Um, but we have been clear that they need to engage with the department, um, that whatever comes up needs to be compliant with with our system and needs to be something that's operable within Northern Ireland. Um, but I do think there has to be some uniformity in terms of the approach taken, because I don't think we can have a kind of two-tiered approach when it comes to dealing uh, with those issues. And it, so it's about having to strike the balance there. Um, as I say, the, the last decision was taken by the Ministry of Justice um, and not by our department and not on the basis of our advice. Um, hopefully we will continue to engage with them on the new legislation and that will be a productive engagement in terms of trying to shape the provisions um, that they're bringing forward. Because I think we can also inform their thinking um, when it comes to how these issues are handled as opposed to the other way around. Um, because it may be that some of the practice here um, may actually be better um, than in other places. I just have concerns about legislation coming forward like that, particularly given the evidence that's come forward from the, the prison service in particular around the whole focus on rehabilitation because is delaying somebody from from being released for an extra year, 18 months or two years, is that is that going to rehabilitate them any further? I, I think that that is where your focus needs to be. I think that it is about rehabilitation. It is about if at some point are we delaying somebody being stabbed in, in London by two years? 
that there's no value in that, and and that's that's my concern. So I, but obviously we'll have further conversations when we see yeah. what's coming forward. I, I, I don't want to um, tie you down that. Just two quick questions out of what you said. Sorry, see in relation to you've said that the non-malls would be included in the stocking legislation, which I'm I'm glad to hear because that was something I actually raised in one of the first committee meetings that I had concerns around people not being able to access them because they were not on benefits, so weren't entitled to legal aid, but were on very you know, low incomes because they usually resulted in domestic violence circumstances. So will they be able to be will that be included in the domestic violence legislation as well? Well there's two there's two separate provisions. Um non molestation orders will still exist. Mm -hmm. So they will, that, that provision will still be there and people will still be able to access it where they meet the threshold um, for, for that to be the case. Um, but we, we are aware that there can be issues for people, particularly people in low paid jobs. It tends to be the, the group that tend to be worst affected, not being able to access um, legal aid, but also not being able to afford um, the, the non molestation order. And more importantly, not being able to afford the legal advice when, for example, um, the person who the order has been served against then seeks to vary the terms and conditions and very often does that on a frequent basis. And that can become a, a, almost like a war of attrition and can be very damaging. So with the in the case of stalking, there will be separate stalking um, prevention orders, um, or protection orders, which will be there, um, which the police will be able to use in order to, to bring those about. In the case of domestic violence, um, there are the domestic violence um, prevention orders that are there and those are included so again that would be a police-led um, initiative so what we're trying to do I guess is to provide a range of tools that are available for the police um, and the courts to use um, in circumstances where a vulnerable victim comes to them and needs protection um, and sometimes as I say the non-molestation order um, isn't always the, the, the right fit and isn't always accessible. I think that by bringing in the um, domestic violence protection orders, that those in themselves um, might actually, I think, be useful um, in some cases of domestic violence. Um, the one area where we haven't included um, in the legislation on domestic violence is the domestic abuse protection orders and notices so I want to draw that to the committee's attention one of the reasons for that is that the evidence base around those and the policy around those is not as well developed England and Wales have introduced them now and what we're hoping is that we will be able to then review the evidence base in terms of uptake and use um, by police service there over the kind of first year, year and a half of them being used and that they could then be added um, at a later stage in future legislation. But at this stage, we think that the domestic violence um, protection orders and notices um, will give, if you like, sufficient um, for sufficient cover for the police to be able to, to implement them and use them. And then we can review um, how they are operating in Northern Ireland and then also how the domestic abuse um, protection orders and notices are operating in England and Wales to see how, whether or not they would add value um, to what we're doing here. So that's that's one area where um, I suppose people may have different views. And again, I'm open to kind of listening on that score because I know that there is a bit of a difference in terms of how it's handled here and how it was handled um, in, the, in the bill in England and Wales. I think that would actually help us to create confidence in, if we bring in good legislation to create confidence in policing because one of the difficulties, as you know at the minute, is they're seen as the people who've let them down, not the PPS, not, not, a, not when it gets further up the food chain. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul Frey. Yes, thank you, Chair. And, uh, Mr. Sir, congratulations on your post. You. Uh, it's not an easy one, uh, but I wish you all the best in the future and certainly give you my commitment personally that as a member of this committee, I work alongside you to produce the best results for our people. Uh, we won't always agree, but uh, we'll always try and work together. Uh, I'll try and be as constructive as I possibly can while still asking the hard questions. And I thank you for coming, uh, for uh, saying that you'll attend the All Party Working Group on domestic violence. It's very, very good of you to do that, and we, we look forward to that. Uh, on the domestic violence bill, why is it the case that when we had a piece of legislation in 2017 ready to go, we have had all the discussions with Westminster with regards to the UK-wide piece of legislation, and given the fact that we have already seen 
private member's bill come before the House in this term. And we've also managed to be able to vote on 45% of next year's, next financial year's budget that we have not yet seen a domestic violence bill come before the House. Okay. Well, first of all, when I came into the department, it was a priority for me, and I said at the beginning that I, I think tackling domestic violence and domestic abuse, um, and the legislation is about changing the conversation around these issues. It's about a culture shift as well as a legislative change. Um, you're correct that there was a bill in 2016. However, things in terms of policy development have moved on since that point, and so it was it was important. Um, that that was able to be reviewed and addressed. There was, as you know, a plan to bring this forward as part of a piece of legislation that would have gone through Westminster. That would not have been as complete um, a solution to this problem. And so I had, first of all, to take a decision, and not an easy decision either, as to whether or not to let that proceed, which would have been quicker but less complete, or whether to decide to bring it back here um, and do this through the Assembly where the committee um, and the NGOs and the charities and so on and the victims would have an opportunity to have ownership um, of the legislation and in consultation with the Chair um, and with various others, um, I think we all agreed that the best place to do this was here. So that, that decision taken, we then had to look at what we wanted to include. So for example, what we are able to include in, in this is um, an aggravator that relates to children being affected, for example, by domestic abuse. So there was new drafting in terms of the legislation that had to be done in order that it would be fit for purpose and encompass all of those issues. There were decisions to be taken, for example, about whether we would include stalking in the domestic violence bill or whether we would do it as a separate bill. So once the decision making was in place, and obviously you know, I had reviewed the, the, the pros and cons of that, we were then able to proceed. It's now, um, we expect the, this to move slightly faster, perhaps, than was anticipated. So I think we were said that it would be April, May, um, it would come to committee. I would be confident that it will be in April. Um, we would be hopeful it will be before recess. Um, we have, we are hopeful now it's gone through kind of proofing with um, Legislative Council in terms of the drafting of the bill. It will then hopefully be able to go to executive in the next week to 10 days. Um, and once we get executive agreement, it will then um, be able to come to the committee um, for scrutiny. And obviously, the committee um, has an opportunity then to decide how long you take over the scrutiny. I don't think any assembly committee yet has managed to complete the scrutiny of a piece of legislation um, in the six-week statutory period. There's a challenge. There's a challenge. <laughs> you can make history as a committee if you do. It is a very narrow, um, circumscribed piece of legislation. So it's not a it's not a wide range and complex bill. It's not like previous miscellaneous um, provisions bills where where things were um, much more complicated. It was many bills in one. This is a single. It's a single issue bill. And that's um, why the frustration in the mayor has absolutely. But that's the reason it's it's it has to be drafted and we have to get it right. I mean, there's no point me bringing a bill to you that's half baked. It has to be correct, and it's as I say, the drafting takes time. It's also fair to say that we're not the we're not the only department bringing forward legislation that needs to be looked at by council and needs to be considered. So there's a there's a there's quite a lot of pressure on them in terms of turning it around. But like we're expecting it to be cleared on Monday um, in terms of being able then to move towards the executive with the permission of colleagues and perhaps if you're if you have the ear of any of your executive colleagues you would encourage them to make sure that it gets an early date for consideration at executive um, and then it will be over to yourselves in terms of where we go from there but yes i mean we want this done quickly um, but i think realistically i've been in post six weeks if we can get this signed off on monday um, i think that's not too bad um, in terms of pace and i think that in terms of delivery um, I think it's quite possible for this to be turned around in a relatively short space of time, even given the challenges it will have in terms of scheduling in the Assembly and committee scrutiny, and given the correct time for that. Okay. On the advocacy support service, which you talked about in your opening uh, gamut, I'm sure you're aware of the disconcernment and worry around the changes with this service. I understand, having spoken to your officials many times on this, and relaying my concerns uh, about the 
the concept of the sexual violence piece and, and trying to make sure there's support. But by bunching it together with domestic violence, are we in real danger of distorting the service and lessening the service that domestic violence victims receive? Uh, on the consortium piece, we haven't got agreement yet, as far as I'm led to believe. Are we anywhere near agreement? Who will lead that consortium? Uh, will the consortium even work? Okay, well, I mean, first of all, we've been working and consulting um, very closely with our partners um, in the voluntary and community sector on this, and we understand that there are a range of views um, on this. Um, the consortium model is still under discussion with those partners and obviously that will take time but in terms of the advocacy support service i suppose the concern is that if you split the service into two more specialized services you could have significant challenges around resource and what is likely to be a small number of people if you properly train the 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 people who are delivering that advocacy support because the key here is that the people who are delivering the service are properly trained, whether it's to deal with domestic violence, whether it's to deal with sexual violence, or whether it is to deal with a combination of both. And I mean, in cases of domestic abuse, there can often be a sexually violent component to that. So often the people who will be dealing with those cases will be dealing with, with a complex combination of offences. For us, it's about ensuring that there is a coordinated response to support the individuals who come forward and that that, is, that response is appropriate um, to their needs. Um, we are still developing thinking on this in consultation with partners. We know that there are strong views on both sides around how best this can be delivered. But I think the key is regardless of the model that is chosen, the focus has to be on the quality of service provision. And that is about training and upskilling people who are providing that service, building on the existing high quality support that's already being provided by organisations, but trying to make it as comprehensive um, as possible rather than what can happen at times is that it becomes quite fragmented. So it's not about trying to reinvent the wheel, it's about trying to build on good practice that already exists in the sector. And as I say, the, the issue about a single advocacy service, I think, is more to do with scale um, and the fact that just in a small jurisdiction with limited resource, it may be better to have one service trained across the full piece and able to deliver flexibly than two services that can't cross over um, where one may be less under pressure than another, there's no crossover between them. So I think that that's the main, the main argument in favour of a single service. But I understand, it, to be clear, in the context of bringing forward a bill on domestic violence and abuse, I think it's absolutely clear that what we're not doing is trying to diminish the seriousness um, of domestic violence or abuse. It's one of the reasons why we're bringing forward specific offences. We're specifically looking at issues like coercive control, um, financial control and abuse, and those other elements. So I think that the legislation puts a framework around it that says that we take the issue seriously, and then what we're trying to do is find the best mechanism for delivering the advocacy support. Um, and as I say, that's still a work in progress, but I'm happy to listen um, to members' views, and no doubt at the APG, I'll hear them. It's one thing getting all those interest groups, and all of them do incredible work, all in their different ways. It's one thing getting them all to agree with regards to consortium. But I'm led to believe that the police has also refused to support the direction of travel and refused to fund it as yet, and so has the health service. Can you comment on that, Minister? No, I can't, um, because that is not something um, that I've been briefed on, but I will ask officials. Um, but my understanding is that the work that's been ongoing um, hasn't led to um, any suggestion of that nature, but I will check and come back to you. And our, you know, final issue, uh, Chair. Something arose in this committee a number of weeks ago when we had the Chief Constable here, and it was a question from the Chairperson himself, who asked him about the, uh, the Independent Monitoring Commission on the status of the Provisional IRA in the Army Council. And we got a very strange answer from Simon Byrne, the Constable, where he basically said it wasn't a question for him 
and it was a question from the Secretary of State. Uh, that then grew into a wider debate. Uh, media picked it up also, of course, and I think it was I, but I'm sure other members through memory had asked you then, Minister, in the floor of the Assembly, and you had answered that it was not for you to comment. Um, can I ask, is that still your position, given the very frank, concise information that has been given by Drew Harris, who has basically illustrated and demonstrated fact, he didn't want to amplify it or clarify it, is the way he said it, he was just delivering fact. You're the Justice Minister. Are those still your beliefs that it's not a question or a comment for you? Because ultimately I think for all politicals, it's something that we have to be mindful of. We have to ensure confidence in our political system. We can't tolerate at any time private armies, terror structures or shadowy groups. Is that still your position, Minister of Justice? Well, I'm going to say a couple of things in response to that. First of all, I agree. The continued existence of paramilitary structures um, is completely unacceptable. Whether that's an army council, combined command, brigadiers, commanders, call it what you will, um, it shouldn't exist in a normalised society. Um, that's clear in terms of the position that we have taken in terms of um, our pledge of ministerial office. Um, and that has been my position um, from the moment I entered politics and indeed um, long before it. The work towards dismantling those organisations is a responsibility not just of the Department of Justice, um, but of, and not actually just of all of the parties of the executive under tackling paramilitarism, um, but it's actually a responsibility of everybody um, who's involved in politics and in community leadership in society. In terms of what I said, what I said was that the assessment of terrorist threat and activity and the existence of organisations is not the responsibility of the Justice Department, and that is a statement of fact. So yes, I stand by that. It is not my job to assess um, whether organisations are active or inactive. Um, that is the responsibility of the Northern Ireland Office to make that assessment. Um, and I will be meeting with the new um, Secretary of State um, and will undoubtedly discuss with him whether he intends or not to make any fresh assessment um, following the decision that was taken in 2015. But as I also um, said um, when, we, when I was asked this in the, in the floor um, of the House, as far as I am concerned, the 2015 situation is as is until new evidence or a new assessment is brought forward. So that's the basis on which I answer. I can't answer for the Chief Constable. I can't have a running commentary on the Chief Constable's answers. That's an operational matter for the police and I respect his independence. I'm certainly not going to. I'm certainly not going to stray into commenting um, on the Guard Commissioner's operations um, because I don't think that would be appropriate either. Um, but look, both men are senior police officers. They've made their statements, and you're as capable of judging what you make of those statements as anybody else. But from my perspective, speaking as Justice Minister, it's not the responsibility of my department to make that assessment. Do you receive intelligence briefings on the status of prescribed organisation? I receive the same briefings that predecessors would have received with respect to levels of paramilitary threat and activity. Um, and again, that would reflect um, both active paramilitarism that would be, um, would be being prosecuted um, by the police in terms of the courts and also um, the background information um, that they would have in terms of levels of activity on the ground. Um, so, yes, I mean, the Justice Minister has kept appraised of those, but those would, for me, in general terms, um, be made by the police um, and be given to me by the police. Yeah, but that was my next question. Who would brief you in that? You know, would it be the police only? Would it be other intelligence services? So it is the police? Well, the only briefing that I have received has come from um, the PSNI. Are they confidential? For your eyes only, if you like? Yes. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, because just to pick up on, on what Paul said, um, your predecessor, David Ford, uh, and this is why we're struggling to understand why the PSNI Chief Constable has ducked this issue in comparison to Drew Harris in the South. 
David Ford said earlier last year, it's important that the PSNI and the Independent Reporting Commission continue to give assessments on paramilitary activity and all political parties use their influence so we see a complete disbandment of such groups. I agree with that. It is important that the PSNI continue to give assessments. PSNI aren't giving that assessment. They didn't give it to this committee. So they're giving it to you in private. Well, to be clear, I said they gave security. I mean, they gave a security briefing to me, and it's not about being in private. It's simply that it's, it's confidential information, and you'll understand um, that you need a level of security clearance in order to be able to receive that information. The point that I would make is um, that the PSNI will still do security assessments on paramilitary organisations and those assessments they provide to the Northern Ireland Office in the course of the Northern Ireland Office doing their assessments, as do the Independent um, Reporting Commission. So I think, I, as I say, I can't answer in terms of the Chief Constable's response in committee, um, but what I can say is that if you go back to the original 2015 statements, um, it talked about the existence of structures, but it also talked about the fact that those structures were not active in directing um, paramilitary activity. I believe that the existence even of legacy structures um, is not appropriate. I said that in my opening remarks, and I believe that it is incumbent on all of us to work to ensure that that situation ends. But I have no, if you like, further insight other than the 2015 um, the 2015 assessment, and it's not for the Department of Justice to make that assessment or to receive other information from other sources to, to make a view on that. Our role is to try to lead the initiatives um, and the executive actions around trying to end paramilitary activity and criminality, and that's what I'm focused on rather than the assessment of it. Um, Things like threat assessment um, come from, as you know, from, from the UK government in terms of the level of terrorist threat. Um, the police will feed into that, um, as will the NIO. So what I'm saying is we are, if you like, responding to what we're briefed as opposed to assessing it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm not going to put myself in the situation where I'm commenting from a perspective where it looks like I'm giving you information that I have access to that others don't. Mm -hmm. I'm being briefed in the same way that anyone else would be. Well, and... and that's what I'd expect, that a politician isn't responsible for the assessment. And that's why I'm concerned that the Chief Constable said it's for the Secretary of State, because he's a politician. It should okay. be coming from the police, not filtered through a political system. Um, can but I, it is I think, I think the case in 2015 yeah. is that the, the um, British government asked for an assessment, which they then published, and that assessment was produced, as I understand it, by the PSNI and the Security Service. The, the difficulty, though, Minister, 2015 is the assessment. Yeah. I'm assuming that the briefings that you've got from the PSNI is consistent with 2015 vis-à-vis -vis current day status of these organisations, including the provisional IRA. But the IRC that reported at the end of last year was silent on the provisional IRA. That therein lies the well, problem. To be clear, in the briefings that I have had, and not to breach the confidentiality around them. It has been about active organisations and levels of threat. Um, and so I have had no briefing around the comments that were included in the 2015 report, no confirmation that it remains like that. I'm simply saying that in the absence of any suggestion otherwise, that's the only information that I have to work off. But I'm not saying that when I had a briefing, it was confirmed to me that nothing had changed. I don't know if anything has changed because I don't know that another assessment has been done. But I think that this is an issue that has to be raised with the Northern Ireland Office and the Secretary of State because terrorism remains a reserved matter. And I'm not trying to duck the question. Um, it's simply not within my purview to be able to give any kind of assessment on that. The 2015 assessment is, as far as I am aware, the last assessment of that particular issue that was done. Um, and that hasn't been updated or changed. I can't speak to whether or not the circumstances have changed, um, but it's an issue really for the Secretary of State to consider. And it's one that I'm sure I will raise with him uh, when I meet with him to discuss um, wider issues. Well, we would add, I would certainly welcome you raising that just before I, I bring in the next member. Um, in terms of the announcement today around the future relationship with the European Union that the UK has published, 
uh, earlier this morning. Yeah. There's a detailed section on law enforcement. Yeah. It covers policing, um, and that report uh, states that the UK government isn't seeking to be part of Europol, Eurojust, uh, and indeed uh, seek access to the European arrest warrant. There are just three issues um, which they have revealed this morning. What's the assessment in terms of your department in respect of the UK's position and how is that being taken forward vis-a-vis -vis your role and the Brexit Executive Subcommittee? Following that, I'm going to bring in then Martina Anderson as the next uh, member. Well, in terms of um, the Future Security Partnership, which is the one that has most direct implications, though not the only one that has implications for the Department of Justice, um, we are obviously conscious of what the UK negotiating position is at the point of uptake. We have been working um, with the Ministry of Justice and with the Home Office in terms of making sure that Northern Ireland specific issues remain on their agenda and that they are sensitive um, to those needs. We have um, had a look, um, and it's, as you will understand, a provisional look um, at that statement as of today. And there are a number of positive elements of that, as well as some that I think will require further refinement. Um, so, for example, um, issues around data sharing and data adequacy that underpin our ability to cooperate, um, whether it's with other police forces, with Europol um, and Eurojust and so on. Those are absolutely crucial um, that those are got right, because unless we can do that and communicate in in live time, then we have serious um, implications um, in terms of the justice system. Um, and we briefed the executive subcommittee um, yesterday. Um, and we had the uh, Assistant Chief Constable, um, uh, George Clark, attended with us and spoke from an operational perspective as to the impact of things like the European arrest warrant and other things. Realistically, there, there will be some challenges here. What has been suggested um, around, um, if you like, replacement around the European arrest warrant um, is a kind of Norway Iceland kind of scenario. Um, to be clear, that's not um, the European arrest warrant by another name. It does fall short and is suboptimal. However, it is better um, than some of the other suggestions that would have tr would, would have occurred had we ended up in a kind of a no deal scenario, or indeed if we do in the future end up in that scenario. Um, the reason I say it's not perfect is that countries can derogate from that, so they're not mm. obligated um, to cooperate with it. Um, as you know already, three countries have derogated from extradition um, with the UK in the transition period. Um, but under any kind of Norway Iceland arrangement, um, we would they would be able to be they would be able to continue to do so. And for example, I think there are six countries who don't cooperate um, in that agreement with them. So it does leave gaps potentially in the system, um, and that's something that we would want to work very closely. We want the European arrest warrant as close as we can have, but obviously there are issues because those are European Union structures and access to them is for European Union members um, and so we need to work on that. With respect to Europol and Eurojust, they're not seeking full membership <clears throat> but a third country agreement and I think in the case of Europol um, they're suggesting a kind of third country plus mm -hmm. um, agreement but again data systems and access um, may well be achieved there. The difference is that there will be no seat on the board so the direction of travel of those organisations are things that we will not have any influence over um, in future. Um, there's also, I think, um, issues around some of the information sharing, um, particularly around CIS2. Mm -hmm. um, there are agreements between the EU, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, um, which are non-Schengen countries and has a dispute mechanism, um, but access, I think, beyond that will be very difficult. Um, and again, I think that there are some issues around um, name passenger lists um, and so on that will be passenger named records and exchange of criminal records that will depend highly on the level of cooperation that we get through the Future Security Partnership, um, but also on data adequacy. As I say, we know that now where, if you like, people's opening starting positions are, um, there is some alignment 
um, between the EU starting position and the UK starting position. Um, but I think more importantly, the expression that both want to have close cooperation um, is something that I think we should encourage and work closely uh, with both sides to make sure that they achieve it because we are undoubtedly more vulnerable mm -hmm. um, to the impact of non-cooperation and um, not being able um, to share that data. Um, the negotiations are starting next week. Um, we don't know when the future security partnership itself will be discussed. Um, but we are working with the Home Office closely and we can provide further updates to committee um, as and when available. I think from our perspective, we want to see this as seamless as possible. Um, I did mention the Future Security Partnership was only one element of it and I think that the future arrangements, particularly um, around trade, um, around some of the infrastructure issues, um, around freight, for example, um, and also um, some of the work that's being done around agriculture. All of those different strands have the potential, um, if not properly managed, and if the arrangements um, are not aligned with what happens in the EU, to cause interfaces which will be exploited um, potentially by organised crime. And so we need to be very conscious as we move um, towards um, kind of separation and divergence, which seems to be the direction that the UK has taken rather than alignment, um, that we are kept abreast of that and are conscious of the potential costs um, in terms of security and policing and the potential implications um, for organised crime to exploit um, those differentials. So I think that that's something that we have been stressing at executive um, and I think colleagues are conscious of as they go into their negotiations, even around the economic elements of, um, of Brexit. But it will be an unsettled period and much of that landscape we can only really respond to once we know what the future arrangements are going to look like. So we can anticipate some of the challenges, particularly in justice, and we can prepare for those. I think the more difficult element will be to judge some of the other risks and threats that exist, um, whether that's around things like civil unrest, whether it's around um, tension, community tensions, around perceptions of where borders and, and checks are being done and all of the rest of it, and then whether the future partnership itself, um, again, is open to organised crime and exploitation. So I think that those things are less in our gift in terms of being able to scope where they are at this point and will become much clearer um, as time goes on, because once we know what the future arrangements look like, it's then it's much clearer to be able to police it. The last thing in that, just to I'll mention, is that we have also said very clearly that we need clarity as early as possible, not just because it will allow the justice partners to respond to it, but I think that there is an important issue about creating a culture of compliance around new regulations, new checks and other things. We talk a lot about a culture of lawfulness in Northern Ireland and the need to establish a, a base culture of law, lawfulness. But there will be a risk if, if systems are unclear or if systems are not um, easy for people who need to use them to follow, that there will be accidental non-compliance, which could become embedded and, and, and routine. And that that in itself could become problematic in terms of getting people then after the event to start to get to become compliant again so we need to make sure that from the outset there is a culture of compliance around this that people are clear what they need to do that it's simple accessible and that they're able to meet the requirements of whatever regulations or laws are in place so that we don't end up in a situation where either by design or default we end up with large parts of the community operating outside the law whether willfully or unintentionally um, and I think that that's really important in terms of the clarity that we have around the systems. And we've made that point, obviously, to colleagues um, through the executive subcommittee. And hopefully um, we'll be able to see some progress um, in terms of the UK government's negotiations over the, the coming months. Okay. okay, thank you. Martina Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And first of all, I want to uh, congratulate uh, the Minister on taking up uh, your post. I know it's a difficult job that you have and you will get the support obviously of the committee but you will also expect the committee to hold the department uh, to account. I just want to add comment uh, to what Linda had said with regards to um, the need at times for positive discrimination in the society that we're in and particularly around the context of 5050 
recruitment and I'm glad to hear that you'll not be bringing just the party position to the determination of this but you'll be looking to have a policing service that is fully representative of the society it serves. Um, I have a number of questions. I will maybe start with the, the one that has been just touched upon with regards to the budget. I noted in the papers that we have received that there's 10.7 million uh, for Brexit for the department of which there's 6.7 for PSNI Capital, and um, particularly concerned with the announcement today around the, the future uh, security partnership, particularly around Europol and Eurojust and the European Arrest Warrant, when we have 40 EU justice measures, as you are all too familiar with, that could be potentially lost if at the end of this there's a no deal. And a number of member states, as you said, already, for instance, will not extradite their citizens, Germany being one of them, one of the big member states, uh, to a non-EU state anyway. And on top of that, if we have the layer of the uh, non-compliance and the regulatory divergence that we heard about today. So I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit more about that, particularly with regards to the expenditure of the budget. If I could pick up on some of the comments that has been made around domestic finance, there is an organisation, I know you've heard of them in Derry, the Dulce Vita, and they are very focal around the need for protect, uh, parental, parental alienation. And parental alienation, I know it has been brought to your attention, and it, I'm just not sure about if it's in the, um, the bill that you're talking about coming forward. The, uh, the World Health Organisation is recognising the emotional and physical harm that's caused to children. Section 60 of the legislation in the, in the south of Ireland has dealt with uh, parental uh, alienation and I'm wondering is this something that uh, has been taken forward by yourself? And I think there are, there's, there's links to that with what Linda had touched upon and others had touched upon around non-molestation orders. I am somewhat shocked that we are still in a situation that victims, because people who are subjected to that kind of physical and verbal abuse um, are victims, and yet when they go forward for non-molestation orders, there are applicants, and the perpetrators are called respondents. Now, I think that is something that uh, should be changed around the, the policy, the language of that, because it is simply not good enough that a victim has to pay to, uh, to get a non-molestation order and uh, just because they work and that's something I think that there's cross-party support about. The issue was raised around, the, the chair had mentioned the human trafficking, uh, the modern slavery and I think um, in terms of trying to deal with that within the criminal justice system, again going back to my initial comment, that relies on the data that you had outlined from Europol, Eurojust, to try to dismantle the modern slavery trafficking network. And when you consider that in 2018, there was an increase here in the North, much to the horror and surprise to most people in society, whether it's about labor exploitation, sexual exploitation, forced criminality, domestic servitude uh, around modern slavery. And I'm very concerned about the implications of how this society will deal with that in the context of Brexit and not having the data sharing that it would enable uh, the PSNI and others to dismantle those networks. I think that's, uh, that's something we're all concerned about. In the crucial issues in the paperwork that we've been given with, I've been looking at the issue of vulnerable persons in prison. And I think it would be helpful in a way for myself as a new member of this committee to find out the composition of those that are in prison in terms of their religious composition, geographical composition, in terms of race, and also to ascertain you know, the cost of keeping a vulnerable person in prison because I know that many of the advocacy groups that are dealing with people who are struggling with mental health issues that end up in prison there is a few that the cost of keeping such people in persons in prison is actually more than what any of those groups would receive to try to keep them in society. Um, so I, I think that that kind of information, and just one final comment in, in relation to the paperwork that I was reading, 
Um, I would like to know more about firearms here in the society, you know, outside of those that are working within the um, you know, personnel that have such certificates for, for their work. But have we a society where, where there are many people in the society? Do we have a gun culture here? Um, because I was just interested to see about the, um, the number of people that were appealing the certificates and that triggered my interest to see what kind of, um, what's the membership, what is the composition of people here in the society that have a firearm. All about it. Okay. Um, well, there's uh, quite a few things there. I'll start um, with the EU um, end of things where I left off with the last question. Obviously, in terms of the demands um, on the budget, the... Uh, well, the, the assurance that we have been given is that uh, where the costs relate directly um, to Brexit, those will be covered by the UK government. Um, and so they don't form, if you like, part of the pressures that we have been reporting to the finance minister. Um, part of the discussion that we've had at the Brexit subcommittee is about the need for departments to identify um, within the various um, business areas where there will be additional costs, um, whether those will be um, the initial kind of setup of new structures, whether it will be ongoing costs in terms of long-term implications of management and so on, um, and to identify those to the Department of Finance so that the bids can be put in the UKG actually Treasury will be able to, to pay for those. So I think it's important that we do try to recoup those costs because I think that it's, a, it's a, if you like, another layer of cost um, in addition to what would be normal for us. And I think the costs in Northern Ireland um, for that may well be higher than in other places. So I think that there is a strong argument for us to do that. <coughs> and the Finance Minister is, is dealing with that in terms of the budget. See, rather than cut across you, Minister, it's just looking at the information that I'm reading here that says there's 10.7 million. Yeah. And of which the 9.8 for the PSNI yeah. was just to try to so that. that was money secured this year, and it, the 9.8. Oh, um, so it, it's money that's been uh, spent during uh, 20, 2019, 2020, and it's almost entirely for uh, new police officers, additional police officers. Uh, since there's been an uplift of uh, approximately 300 uh, police officers and staff as a result of that funding, uh, which we hope and expect will be baselined in terms of future years. Um, so th that's what the vast majority of that money was used for. Then there was small amounts in addition, um, which were used for you know, the administrative capacity required within the department, within the court service and so on, to make the necessary uh, steps uh, that, that were, were required for EU exit. And obviously there is a cost to the department in terms of the assessment and analysis of where these costs are going to inc be incurred. So that's an ongoing pressure that, that we face. Um, but it is something that the Department of Finance, as I say, have said to us that they want us to keep separate, if you like, to our regular challenges and, and other things so that they can then press Treasury to cover those um, as we were assured they would. Um, but that's an evolving situation, as you can imagine. In terms of parental alienation, um, the Dolce Vita have been in touch with me, um, and actually I was hoping to be able to go up um, and meet with them, though I think the initial timing that we had hoped to set up um, won't necessarily work. But parental alienation is a significant issue, undoubtedly. Um, it has massive consequences for the non-resident parent, um, but also for the children and the relationships. And we know that relationship breakdown um, can have long-term um, uh, negative impacts um, if not handled um, in a constructive way. I think that that really falls under the <coughs> kind of um, family courts and justice um, issue that um, Sir John Gillen had taken mm -hmm. before. Um, and obviously he's done a number of reviews. We're trying to take forward elements of that that will make a difference to people. And parental alienation is one element that we need to look at in terms of what the best response from the department might be. So it's not included in the domestic violence bill. Um, so that's, it's, not, it's not part of that um, or domestic abuse. Um, but it is an area where I think that there is more work needs to be done um, in terms of establishing how best to address it. It may not, <coughs> in fact, need legislative change, but simply a change in terms of practice and procedure. And so that's something else that we need to look at um, in terms of the reviews that have been done so that that kind of parental alienation is recognised and taken account of when it comes to 
for example, the family court system and when decisions are being made um, in respect of access, custody and other things, that there's raised awareness of the risk um, of parental alienation because we know that it has a very detrimental impact um, on those affected by it. It is an area where I think that there is more um, work to be done and it's one that I would want to return to when policy is better developed. Because I think people would have expected it in the domestic um, bill that was going forward, the domestic violence bill. We have already Section 6 in the, in the south yeah. of Ireland, so there's a model there that would help. I think the issue is that the domestic violence bill, the domestic abuse bill coming forward, is dealing with issues around um, coercive control, <coughs> financial control and other things. And it may be that some forms of parental alienation will fit within that definition, but parental mm -hmm. alienation per se is not mentioned in the bill um, so I think you know it may well be that uh, it may well be that there will be elements um, of the bill that would be able to be used in order that if parental alienation is one of the, the kinds of course of control that's being exercised mm -hmm. and obviously the bill takes account of the aggravating factor of children either witnessing domestic abuse or violence or about that being um, exerted over a child where they're actually the, the, the victim of domestic abuse or violence. So again, if that domestic abuse involves coercive control of a child, um, not to see the non-resident parent, for example, there may be an issue there that can be pursued through it, but it isn't a specific um, offence um, within that bill. Um, the other issue you asked about was modern slavery. And I think there's an increasing recognition of the need um, to deal with this alongside issues around organised crime. Um, I know that when I sat on the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee and we did quite a bit of research into smuggling, what we realised um, from the evidence that we got at that stage was that essentially for a lot of organised crime um, gangs, the contraband the, it is not the issue. It's establishing routes. And once they establish routes, um, they then simply see everything that travels through that route as a commodity. And it doesn't matter if it is a human person um, that's being trafficked or whether it's cigarettes or anything else, firearms or whatever it might be. And so I think that there is a real challenge um, in terms of ensuring that people first of all, in our community, are alert to signs of, for example, um, domestic servitude, um, that they see exploitation and are willing to report it. I think there's a need to ensure that when they do, um, or that when victims um, of um, trafficking come forward, that the right support is in place for them and, and that they are properly cared for. But I think you're correct in saying that access to those international um, organisations like Europol, Eurojust um, and Interpol and others are crucial. We've seen just in the last month um, some excellent police work in terms of breaking up issues of organised crime, where, if you like, the crime gangs weren't based in Northern Ireland, but were using Northern Ireland as a base for money laundering. So I think we also need to not be parochial about this issue. I mean, we are, like every other place, vulnerable to um, international crime gangs actually using us as a base um, from which to operate. And so it's important from that perspective. Um, that we do work through international organisations. My understanding for what it's worth, and as I said, is only quite an early assessment that the department gave me on this today, is that with respect to Europol and Eurojust, what the UK is seeking um, is not full membership because they will have that access, but they would have one um, as they do with the EU and the USA. Now that actually allows full sharing of information and full cooperation. It simply means that you're not sitting on the board that directs how the organisation develops and the decisions. And if that is the case, and I mean, I think that that is not necessarily the worst outcome in terms of being able to continue to use the resource that's available. I don't think it's in either the EU's interests or in the UK's interests for us not to have full cooperation and access and that's where data adequacy becomes absolutely crucial because unless people are confident that they, the information shared with the UK is properly held and properly managed and all of the other challenges that we face then we will find that cooperation harder to sustain but I don't think anyone would want to see 
us take retrograde steps that made it more difficult for us to deal with issues like human trafficking and slavery. Um, and I think it's important um, that we raise public awareness as well as maintain the ability to predict um, from an intelligence and policing side as to what's going on in some of these larger scale crime gangs. You asked a few issues that I think were about statistics um, and I think it would be best if we came back to you with those. You'd asked about um, the the kind of breakdown of the prison population um, and we can get you some more statistics around that. Um, and you'd mentioned about vulnerable prisoners. I think it would be fair to say that there is significant work being done uh, with vulnerable prisoners. I mean, when I was in Magabri, I went to see um, the, the initial... Um, I went to see Ban House, so when people arrive there, that's where they will initially go. And I went to talk to some of the prisoners who were there, who actually are peer mentors around mental health. And we looked at some of the work that's being done there to offer support um, to people who are coming into the prison system, have never been there before and are finding it quite traumatic. I think we also recognise that a significant amount of the prison population have pre-existing mental health conditions. Um, so around a third of people who are in the prison system have already um, had contact uh, with the with the health service around mental health issues. Um, around 90% would self-identify as having substance abuse problems or substance misuse problems. Um, and some of that will be people essentially self-medicating with either alcohol, prescription drugs um, or illicit drugs. Um, because of mental health issues and so we recognise that a significant proportion of the prison population are vulnerable and I think that part of the work that's being done in prisons in terms of having um, kind of joined up working with health, having people who are mental health professionals on site to help assess <clears throat> but also being able to identify prisoners who are already in the system who can mentor and support people coming into the system and provide them with um, provide people with a, an outlet to talk if they do um, feel pressure I think is really important and I was I was I have to say I was very impressed um, in speaking to one of the young peer mentors um, in McGabry who was explaining to me the work that he does in going along and essentially befriending somebody who has just arrived and telling them who they should speak to if if they are upset, if they are distressed or whatever it might be, and kind of working through with them what the best ways to do it was. And I think that even just in those initial 24, 48 hours is really important. <coughs> I think also the work that's being done um, in terms of the custody suites, even in police stations where people are being brought in um, increasingly because people are, are reporting when they phone the police, not necessarily crimes, but it's individuals in distress um, who are phoning the police for assistance. And so people are often brought into custody because there is nowhere else for them to go. Um, and so I think the work that's being done there in terms of having proper mental health facilities on site and being able to assess the needs of, of the person um, and provide, if you like, the right care um, for them is hugely important. I do think there is there will always be a challenge um, around this. Um, but it's something that the prison service and prison officers have taken very seriously and there have been significant improvements. Um, today I actually was um, in Hyde Bank because um, some of the young people in Hyde Bank would and some of the women prisoners there had been involved in six weeks of non-contact boxing training um, and Paddy Barnes and um, Carl Frampton were there today presenting um, their certificates for participation. I was talking to the people who have been through that, that that course and actually a lot of them talked about the fact that they want to continue that when they leave because they had struggled with depression and mental health issues and they found that the training and the exercise had helped them deal with stress, anxiety, depression, um, had made them feel fitter and healthier but they'd also had a course around nutrition um, mindfulness, other things. And that helps to build, I think, resilience um, within people who will eventually be returned to our community um, and hopefully will be returned in a way that they can actually make a positive contribution to society, um, but also in a way that they're more resilient and more able to cope with life than perhaps they were when they arrived. So those kind of positive interventions, and that's the first time that's ever taken place, a course like that um, in any prison in the UK. 
So that's an event of work that's being done by the prison service to try and help um, people who are in our care actually deal with mental health challenges in a constructive and productive way that has long term um, outturns for them um, when they actually leave the prison system. Okay, just one, one. And the firearms, we will get back to back you with the statistics. Yeah, back on that. Um, in relation to resolving the dispute of the courts, uh, the workers in the courts here in strike, would you give us an update as to where that is at? I'm going to pass that one to Peter because that's a, that's a long standing issue um, before my time, so I'm going to. Um, are you talking about the fact that, that, that some staff members are currently mm -hmm. taking strike mm -hmm. action? Yes, 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 that relates to a pay dispute that uh, is being addressed by the Department of Finance on behalf of the whole of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. So it's not a matter that the Department of Justice is directly dealing with. There are negotiations going on between unions and the Department of Finance about the pay deal. So they're working directly with the Department of Finance. Because all civil servants are paid okay. under the same basis. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Martina. That's right. Yep. Thanks very much, Chair and Minister. Congratulations on your appointment. Look forward to working with you like, like everyone else here. So, um, there have been a number of issues already touched upon around um, domestic violence and, and abuse, and, and I look forward to the shape and form of that legislation when, when it manifests itself. Could I raise one other particular issue with you that, that has caught my attention fairly frequently now, and that is the, the whole question. and. They, if you heard the news this morning, that report which came out, I think it was from, what was it? It was on behalf of as the National Children's Bureau. You know the, the issue around children's performance and things that were in general affecting them, and peer pressures and the likes. Uh, the whole question of cyberbullying. Um, now, I'm not quite sure what can be done about that, but it's increasingly becoming a really serious issue particularly among young people and particularly among school kids. Um, now, I'm not expecting an instant answer from you today, Minister, by any means, manner or fashion, but it is one of the one of the issues. We hear about peer pressure, we hear about academic pressures. But in those cases that have come to my attention where kids have been subject to this, it has been really vitriolic and really bad stuff. So, um, if I could leave that one with you and perhaps um, maybe a bit of reflection on that if we get here a wee bit further down the line, Chair, about this, if you choose to reply. Uh, yeah, no, well, I'm happy, I'm happy, I mean, in terms of cybercrime generally and, and, and online offences, in the main, it's a matter for Westminster to legislate yeah. because it's a reserved matter. Um, but things that would be criminal, if you like, um, under the law offline mm -hmm. remain criminal when they're online so things like harassment and abuse and so on yes. that would pass the criminal threshold doesn't matter whether it's in person or whether it's on twitter it's still a, it's still a criminal offense so there is a degree of read across um though it would be for um the uk government to develop specific legislation to deal with mm -hmm. with cyber crime specifically yeah. and particularly the, the kind of online abuse in terms of the, the cultural issues and the education piece, I think that there is work to be done in terms of the kind of keeping people safe and raising awareness of that. But it's not necessarily one specifically for the Department of Justice. It would be one that I think is an education piece, but one where perhaps health, communities, education, justice and others would be able to work together um, in order to kind of deal with those issues. Just at a very personal level, and I think many of us who are on social media would 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 probably recognise it. I think the biggest challenge at the moment in terms of online abuse is anonymity, in terms of being able to use accounts without names. And I think that that is increasingly a challenge. It's a challenge often for the police where they identify an offence but find it hard to identify an offender. Um, and I think it can be very difficult um, for those who are subject to abuse because I think that the anonymity gives people carte blanche to say and do whatever they like and they feel they can get away with it um, and that they won't be traced. So I think that there's a challenge for online providers, service providers, um, to step up and take action that actually is better at dealing um, with some of that online abuse. I do worry at times when you report things and you get an answer back from some of these organisations that say it doesn't breach their community standards. I dread to think what their community is like if that's the standard um, of conduct that they deem acceptable. And I think that there is a wider piece of work, you're right, that needs to be done. Um, in terms of the impact that this has on people, because I do think um, that online abuse, um, intimidation, threats, um, and a lot of the other kind of stuff that w we're increasingly seeing online <coughs> is something that is a, an emerging issue 
um, it's having real impact on people. But as I say, I suppose from a purely Department of Justice point of view, the key issue is that if it's an offence offline, yeah. it's an offence online. So if somebody, for example, um, is harassing someone online, it's still harassment. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that that's the key thing um, for the police to prosecute in those cases. And I mean, to varying degrees of effectiveness, I know that they really do try um, where, where that's happening to take it seriously. I think it's when it comes to the kind of bullying, particularly at school level, that it's an educational piece that needs to be done as much about how to protect yourself online um, and uh, also an educational piece for parents to be aware of the kind of information, the kind of material um, that children can be subjected to. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Minister. Um, back to the issue of the human trafficking and the international cooperation that's required and the exchange of data, all those things to, to capture these people because we it was awful in Essex, but I'm sure Essex is, is an example of uh, really what happened there was those, those people died and we saw some of the scale and level of the problem. So the point being is that we cannot sort of understate the necessity for exchange of police and inter international cooperation between jurisdictions to head off organised crime, trafficking, drugs, all those types of things that go on. So um, I know you understand it, but as members here, I think we have to support you very much in that because those types of things going on are just awful. And poor people have been manipulated, abused, and in that instance, uh, died as a consequence of of that tra trafficking and, and organised criminality. And in um, some cases, the, the allegations are that it, it's traced here to our own country. So, um, Minister, I think any support that could be given, I'm sure, by this committee in heading off that and tackling that criminality, that awful criminality, would be <coughs> assured to you. Um, it would also be very welcome, um, I think, particularly at a time um, when these issues are, I think, more in the public consciousness, um, but also at a time when our structures are changing. Yes. It's important that we maintain the the strong approach around organised crime, trafficking, and of course you're correct, um, that when people are trafficking, it doesn't matter whether it's people, drugs, firearms, mm -hmm. whatever, they don't care, and they don't care about the outcomes for the people that they are trafficking either. Um, and the tragedy of this is that you know, um, people die in transit, um, but also that people who make it to their end destination um, often don't um, end up in the circumstance that they thought they were going to end up in when they when they left home. Um, some are trafficked um, against their will. Um, some believe that they're being assisted and therefore don't even recognise that they are trafficked. And yet when they arrive in a place, they find that they have absolutely um, no power to determine their own future. Um, and it is, they're a hugely vulnerable group of people. And I think that we need to make sure that the, that the public are aware. I mean, if something seems too good to be true, if a service is being provided at a rate that is eye-poppingly good, it probably is too good to be true, and you need to ask questions um, as to why it can be provided at such a low rate. You know, and I think just making people aware of that—that that these are crimes that actually affect individuals' lives, um, profoundly so—and that you are supporting criminal gangs that next week could be trafficking drugs into the same community, I think is really important um, in terms of getting the support of communities to actually assist and help those who have been trafficked. And I think anything from the committee's point of view that shines a light on that and which offers support um, in, the recommend, in the kind of work that we're doing as a department um, with um, the Home Office and so on around maintaining that cooperation across borders, I think would be hugely welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, if I could just uh, move on to, to one other issue, and um, that's the it was raised during during the week in the newspapers, and very sensitive issues were coming on to the anniversary of uh, the death of, of three teenagers in uh, Greenville and Cookstown. Perhaps, Minister, you give us some insight into the department and where the department is on the request for a meeting with some of the, the relatives. Well, I mean, obviously, like everyone else, I think um, we'd want to extend our sympathy to the families. I mean, 
I think it's just unimaginable um, what they've been going through over the last year. Um, incredibly difficult and an incredibly sensitive time, I think, for all of them. Um, as you'll be aware, it's an ongoing investigation, um, both with the police ombudsman and um, with the police. Um, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on the investigation itself um, at this point in time because both have to have operational independence and I would want them to be allowed to bring um, their, their investigations to conclusion. Um, I have received a letter from one of the families requesting a meeting and I have responded to say that in that context I wouldn't be able to meet them at the moment while it's a live investigation. However, when the investigation is complete, I would be more than happy to sit down with all of the families um, and talk to them about their experience because I think it's important to listen um, to those who go through the justice system about their experience and try to respond to that to ensure um, that we improve um, our performance every, uh, on every occasion and also that where things are done well that we continue to do those things well and build on that good practice. So from my point of view, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to meet them at this point in time, but I would be keen to meet them um, once the investigations have concluded. Um, and I think that that is probably the most appropriate time um, for me to then have a conversation with them in order to ensure that there's no perception or reality of any kind of influence um, in terms of the outcome of the investigations. Okay, thanks very much for that, Minister. Thank you. Okay, just before I bring Gordon in, um, Linda just wanted to pick up on that last point. Yeah, it's just a quick point on the what you had said about obviously afterwards, you know, the speaking to the families. I think maybe even given the, the breadth of this investigation and how massive it was, there might be more learning that could be done. So even wider than that, probably it, it would be worth looking at how everything was handled in terms of Obviously, the police ombudsman is doing an investigation, and we'll just see what comes out of all that, and, and now the PSA investigation into what happened. But I think there's, there's, there has to be, there's bound to be learning from this, and how we can do things better, and and also in how things were done well at, at this time. So I think just even wider than that, there might be be a bit of work to be done in, in the aftermath when everything is complete. And I'm happy to work with members, obviously. I know that some of you have a constituency interest in it, but I know that all of, I think everyone would have an interest in the sense that we just, I mean, we obviously have a compassion for the families who were involved and the, the loss of young people. It was, it was really difficult, and particularly, I think, for the community. Um, it was just a very difficult experience all around. So, I mean, I'm more than happy um, to engage with you um, after we get a result in, in terms of, of the investigations. Okay. Okay. Gordon. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister and Peter, for coming along this afternoon. I wish you well in your post. Um, you will be aware of the strong cross-community concern there has been in relation to the, the drastic changes to abortion legislation in Northern Ireland and um, the, the strong concerns that have been raised over the issue. Um, can you advise us or tell us what engagement you've had with the Northern Ireland Office around the new regulatory framework? On abortion due at the end of March? Um, I have had no in, in direct engagement um, in terms of the regulatory framework because it's a matter for the Department of Health. Um, abortion is no longer um, a criminal matter, um, so the issue um, has is for the Department of Health to take forward, um, and so justice doesn't have a role in that. Um, I have had a briefing <coughs> from the Northern Ireland Office um, in terms of their plans for um, the framework that they intend to bring forward. Um, and I had a briefing um, from Robin Walker earlier this week um, setting that out, and my particular interest in that is whether or not it was his intention to bring forward, as was indicated, um, exclusion zones around clinics and places offering service, um, whether that be um, advice and guidance or whether it be termination services. Um, and so I engaged with him on that because there would be a justice element in terms of the implementation of that. Um, and at this stage, no final decision has been made on that. But with respect specifically to guidance, it's a matter for the Department of Health and the Health Minister. Are you aware of when the Northern Ireland Office consultative document or the response document will be released? I'm not. Um, I, my understanding is that the... the the actual guidance is due to be brought forward um, 
shortly because the consultation, when it was completed, I'm not sure if the consultation document has been published, but I do know that um, the consultation is completed and they are now at a stage of quite an advanced stage in terms of developing um, proposals for regulation. So I think that the next stage would be for those then to be um, brought forward. And it but it will be done, I think, um, in consultation with the Department of Health, who will then have to provide um, guidance around uh, for clinicians and so on um, that complies with the regulations that have been put in place by the NIO. Okay, is it your understanding that the <coughs> Assembly has a full responsibility for the law and the policy in relation to the abortion? Would you welcome a possible open and frank debate on any changes to the legislation? Well, it's not a matter for me as Justice Minister um, to do that. It's a matter for health because it's no longer a criminal issue, so it hasn't it doesn't, it doesn't impinge on the Department of Justice at all. It would be a matter that you would need to raise with the Health Minister if you wanted to have a debate um, around regulation um, and future future change to that. Um, but, I mean, obviously, all of these matters um, through the Department of Health would be within the purview of the Assembly um, to take forward and debate, but it's not an issue for the Department of Justice. It's not an issue. Right, OK. Um, moving on, in our local Bangor Spectator, this today there was an issue which is obviously in the public realm um, about a dad who is very concerned about uh, his son who a uh, case went to court and uh, as a result of an attack that took place on him uh, his son uh, uh, was bottled and, and uh, had a serious injury receiving 15 stitches to his face and as a result almost lost his eye the bottom line is his dad is calling feels that the punishment should fit the crime. The punishment that was given, as I understand it, um, was um, he was given... Uh, actually, the attacker had, I think which is important to realise, that he had a record of 106 convictions prior to this, and he was given 100 hours in community service and three years on probation. In your opinion, do you feel that that uh, is, is justice and that... Uh, the punishment given fits the crime? Well, I think the first thing to say is that I don't know the details of the specific case to which you refer. Um, secondly, even if I did, it wouldn't be appropriate for me as Justice Minister to comment on individual sentence and decisions. Um, it is public knowledge. You know, it's, it's a public well, paper. I know you said it was in the Bangor Spectator. I haven't read this week. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. But uh, on, with respect to um, the issue, it wouldn't be appropriate for me, even if I did know the case, to comment on a specific case. Um, it is a matter for the judiciary to sentence um, within the guidelines that are provided for them. And they have independence from the Department of Justice and from political influence. And so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on specific sentences. There has been, as you know, a review of sentencing. Um, which has just concluded, and um, so there is an opportunity for people. Obviously, there was an opportunity for people to feed into that sentence and review their concerns uh, with respect to sentencing, um, but it's not a matter on which I can comment as Justice Minister. But it is an issue of concern out in the community. You know, there is this perception in many cases the justice is justice is not not right, it's not properly measured and in, in cases like this uh, is that dad is calling for is a punishment to fit the crime in this case it doesn't fit the crime well as i say i can't comment on whether it does or doesn't because i wouldn't also have all of the information that a judge would take into account when setting a sentence um so i wouldn't have been through the trial have the background information um, and everything else um, that the judge would have taken into account I, on the wider point, in terms of how sentencing works and whether or not people feel confidence, I would agree that the justice system, it's important that people recognise and understand um, that sentencing reflects the seriousness of the incident um, and that it reflects the seriousness of the crime. I think there's also a need, too, for those of us involved in politics and those of us particularly with an interest in justice. Um, to understand how sentencing is constructed um, and how sentencing works, because I think often there is a perception um, outside which is based on a false notion of how the sentencing system works. And I think it's important for us to be able to communicate how sentences are arrived at in those more general terms as opposed to specific cases. But undoubtedly, um, as uh, and I'm sure you will, 
um, local representatives, whilst the judiciary are free and independent and able to make their own decisions, and as it should be. And whilst as Justice Minister, it's not for me to intervene in individual cases, there is nothing to preclude any MLA from writing to the Lord Chief Justice or from writing to the Director of Public Prosecutions um, if you have a concern about a specific sentence um, to seek an explanation um, so that you can better understand why the sentence was arrived at um, and how the sentence was calculated. Um, and it's something that as an MLA um, I occasionally did. Um, so that I can have a better understanding of why that sentence um, was deemed to be appropriate. Sometimes I was satisfied with the answer and sometimes not, but I think it's a useful exercise um, just in terms of being able to understand that in some cases there are complex issues that are being considered um, that may not necessarily be in the public domain. Okay, just finally, I, I raised the issue with you about the introduction of a Places of Worship security scheme, and thank you for the prompt answer on that. Um, I think it is an important issue uh, that, and that we understand that the, um, the scheme operates in the rest of the UK and certainly in England and Wales. Would, would you give us an assurance that you will uh, make that a priority to try and bring that forward? Well, we're currently um, reviewing the situation um, to see what the body of evidence is on that. Um, England and Wales has a system in place already, um, and I think some of that was due to specific vulnerabilities around some places of worship where there had been um, particular um, targeted attacks. Um, I believe Scotland is due um, to introduce a similar scheme, um, and we're looking at whether or not a scheme is required um, in Northern Ireland. Um, in the Republic of Ireland, there's no scheme um, of protection for that. Um, but we're going to look and see. It would be, I think, important also just to say in terms of reassurance that the number of attacks on places of worship remains quite low um, in Northern Ireland, and I would hope that it would be a reducing number. Um, I share your concern and understand that places of worship are not just buildings, but they are places that matter to people. They are places that matter to communities. And I think that people, <coughs> understandably, um, are very upset when they see things that are sacred um, to them um, being destroyed um, by people, whether it's for vandalism, whether it's for hate crime, um, or whatever it might be. And it's a very unnerving, upsetting, and intimidating experience for those involved. So not in any way to diminish the seriousness of such attacks, but they remain at a low level. And we will certainly look at the evidence um, based to see whether or not a scheme that would support um, in the way that there is a scheme in England and Wales is something that would be useful um, in the Northern Ireland context. But I would hope also um, that as communities, um, we would try to educate um, those who would often be engaged in vandalism and antisocial behaviour around places of worship of the value um, that they have in the community, of the impact that they can have in the wider community um, and of the contribution um, that they are making to the wider community as well. Um, because it's not only people who are regularly attending church on a Sunday um, who benefit from that place of worship, it's often all of the organisations um, and so on that happen during the week. Um, and it can have a really detrimental impact and a disruptive impact, um, particularly in smaller congregations um, when a place of worship is attacked um, in the way you suggest. So it is something that we are reviewing and we will look at. Great. And okay. I'll revert to you once we've made a decision. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. J just for completeness, Minister, I just wanted to tidy up some of the questions that Mr Dunn raised at the start. Um, I note that you've just engaged with Robin Walker this week. In respect to your officials, have they been engaging with the NIO over these regulations from Westminster past the legislation? I appreciate that covers a period that wasn't under your watch. I would, ha I would have to check, um, but I would see no reason um, why the department would have needed to, other than just to clarify um, any kind of pre-existing issues or any read across. But it has now transferred to the NIO to make the, the regulations. Um, and that will then become a matter for health in terms of carrying it forward. I mean, there will still be elements of this that are subject to um, criminal law. So, for example, um, there will still be issues around um, 
those who breach the regulations could still be charged with actual bodily harm, for example, um, and other offences. But in terms of the specific issue around termination of pregnancy, um, it, it would fall into that criminal um, into that criminal law system. Now, I suppose we're, we're awaiting to see what the regulations actually are, and then we'll know what what happens if you're outside of the regulations. And, and clearly, there will be still an interface with the criminal law. It's yeah. Uh, and to be I'll, clear, I haven't seen the saying. regulations. I oh. met with the minister and we had the discussion and he talked through what he was likely to include and not include. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really more from the perspective, uh, in our case, of, of whether or not he was taking forward certain elements that had been included um, in the original um, kind of instruction in Parliament. There's been no formal consultation with either the department or the executive in terms of whatever package is coming forward on these regulations that you're aware of? I'm not aware of any consultation with the executive, but it wouldn't have been through the Department of Justice that that consultation would have been brought. It would have been through the Department of Health. Um, but I haven't been consulted at, it, at the executive. I haven't received papers about it or anything from um, the executive on that basis. In terms of formal consultation with the department, I mean, no one's written to me asking for an opinion um, or a view. Um, so, I mean, that's the space that we're in at the minute. It is an NIO responsibility. I mean, I can certainly check whether or not there has been any consultation with the department, and Peter may know um, before I arrived, but certainly I'm not aware of any ongoing um, consultation with the department, as I say, other than around those issues around the interface uh, with the justice system. <coughs> I'm not aware of the detail. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's been some contact, but we'd have been working closely with the Department of Health um, to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what the issues are. But the Minister's right, there won't have been any formal consultation because no one's seen any of the proposals that are coming forward. Would it be a, a model that you would wish to take forward, Minister, in terms of the legislative process that Westminster followed to make this type of change? Would you be recommending this approach for the Assembly to take a similar uh, I don't follow. In terms of the actual legislative change in this issue, no consultation with the public attached through an amendment to the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act. Final stage got 17 minutes of a debate on such a fundamental. Would that be something that you would support a member of the Assembly doing to a piece of legislation, the same kind of Westminster process? Well, I have to <coughs> say, I have to say that it's. I said at the time that I didn't believe that it was the best uh, way to resolve the issue. Um, because I don't believe that it was the best way to resolve the issue. However, it may well have been the only way um, to resolve the issue at that time. Um, but that notwithstanding, it is not um, the best way to make legislation. I think I've made that clear even in bringing back the domestic violence um, and domestic violence and abuse bill to the Northern Ireland Assembly. I actually believe that whether we agree or disagree, um, proper consultation <coughs> and engagement is crucial in terms of shaping legislation. So. From my perspective, I'm committed to ensuring that the committee and the assembly get their full say um, when it comes to any legislation that's coming forward from my department. Um, and I think it's important that people have a right um, to have the debate, to have the scrutiny, um, and to have the input. And indeed, if they want to make amendments, I mean, I've, as you know, I have raised with you the issue around amendments to some of the legislation um, that will be coming forward. And obviously it's helpful from the department's point of view um, if we're not receiving huge amounts of amendments because that will cause a delay in terms of delivery of the main objectives of the bill. But it is the right um, of the committee and of assembly members to bring forward whatever amendments they choose. Um, but I do think that the best way um, to make a change in legislation is to do it based on a well-developed policy framework um, and one that has been properly stress-tested. Uh, one that has been consulted on publicly, um, and one that has been brought forward. I would say, in fairness, that whilst the amendments to the Westminster legislation um, specifically um, weren't able to be consulted upon, the issues had been consulted upon um, many times, and indeed the previous Assembly um, had looked and scrutinised at a bill um, that would have not had the same effect, actually a much more um, minimal change, um, but the issues were certainly aired and consulted upon, um, I think, at length um, before the decision was taken in Westminster, but obviously that was neither within my control nor something that's at my, at this part of my role as Minister of Justice. Okay. Thank you. Pat Sheehan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, thanks, Minister, for coming in today. Um, just uh, 
go back to the discussion that took place earlier around the 50-50 recruitment. Um, and, and you talked about evidence in terms of any future discussion around the matter. And the evidence is, is that since 50-50 was stopped, the, uh, the, the number of recruits from a Catholic background and the actual number of Catholics in the police service has remained stubbornly static. But I don't want to talk about that issue. I want to go to another issue which is even worse than that, and that's the situation in the prison service. And Ronnie Armour was in a couple of weeks ago and told us that only 15% of the workforce in the prison service comes from a Catholic background. And I'm just wondering, uh, and, and, and this is no reflection on my opinion of Ronnie, because I know he's doing, uh, uh, he's, he's doing a good job and I have a high opinion of him. But in terms of the plans that he has to rectify that situation, uh, I was very disappointed. And I'm wondering what is the department and what are you going to do to try and bring about change and, and uh, ensure that the workforce in the prison service is representative of the community? Well, I think that the first thing I would say is that not all of society's problems are things that I can resolve as Justice Minister. And so I think that there is a challenge also to the committee, um, to you as elected representatives and to your parties in terms of changing the culture and perception of some of the roles that people play in society. So I think that there's a massive piece of work that can be done. Um, and One of the things that I want to do is talk about what the role of a prison officer actually looks like in a modern prison service, because I think that the idea of a prison officer as a jailer who simply locks people up um, and that that's the end of their role probably doesn't make it particularly attractive to quite a lot of people and not just people um, from a Catholic background. I think that there is a need to look at what the opportunities are within the service um, for people to be able to progress their career, for people to be able to have an opportunity who are interested in rehabilitation and reform. Um, and I think that there again needs to be the kind of political support. You'll be aware um, of the threats that have been issued against those, for example, who supported the police in the recruitment campaign. Um, but often what is less um, acknowledged is the level of threat under which some of the prison officers actually have to live um, as a result of the work that they do with some very difficult prisoners. So I think that there's a work, a piece of work that needs to be done, not just by me as Justice Minister, though I'm happy to lead on this, um, but also I think um, by wider society in terms of recognising the value um, of the work that prison officers do, the importance of the role that they play um, in terms of creating a safer, um, and a safer community. Um, and in terms of rehabilitation, and also um, in encouraging people to consider it as a valid choice when it comes to making a decision um, about future careers. And I think that by creating safer communities where people are able to make those choices, um, we make it easier for people to come forward. I know that it's something that Ronnie and I have discussed, um, because again, I believe that as with any other line of work, we want to reach a point where we have um, a reflective prison service in the same way as we have a reflective police service. That's what we want to that's that's our ambition. Um, my point I guess I'll just ask you on one point, uh, Minister, do you make a distinction between representative and reflective? Well, no I don't. Um, because I think it's very hard. I mean I don't think well, let's say, yes, there's, I suppose there is a technical distinction, but I don't make that distinction in, in the language that I was using. I think that it's important that the police service, the prison service, and indeed society at large, that it is reflective of, the, of wider society. Will it always be 100% representative? Um, well, no, because there will be fluctuations that are natural. It's a bit like there are times when there are fewer women and more women on committees and different things like that. But I think if there's a persistent problem, and I think that's what you're talking about, when there is a persistent underrepresentation, then that's something that should be identified and addressed. Um, all I would say is that, from my perspective, I think it is important um, that we tackle it. I don't have, a, personally, I don't have... Um, if you like any objection um, to working with others and listening to suggestions. But I would say that it is, a lot of this is going to be a society-driven um, agenda as much as prison service. And I know the work that Ronnie is planning in terms of trying to promote and encourage um, not just 
um, people from um, the ca our Catholic background, but again, people from more diverse backgrounds generally um, to consider the prison service um, as, as an option in terms of a future career and any assistance um, and guidance that members can offer us in terms of how we do that and do it effectively, I think would be very welcome. Yeah, and I understand all the challenges that there are in putting some people into the prison service, uh, some people from some backgrounds into the prison service. Uh, but if the police can get their, their numbers up to over 30 per cent uh, in what would be considered to be a much more dangerous occupation than uh, the prison service, why are the prison? Why is the the, the the statistics in the prison service still sitting at fifteen percent? Well, I mean, I'm going to say a couple of things. I mean, first of all, um, I think the chairman mentioned at the very beginning that sometimes prison service can be a bit of a Cinderella service where people actually forget or don't fully understand um, the value of it or what it does. And I think, unfortunately, with society. When people are in prison, they become a forgotten population. People are not conscious um, and thinking about what's going on within the prison walls. They're interested in why people end up there and what happens when they come out. But in the interim, often people just see it as a black box and they don't take an active interest in that. That's something that I think should change. I think people need to be actively engaged in what happens in prison and understand the complex work of prison officers. I, I think that there are challenges about that and people understanding that actually, as I say, it is there, there is room for innovation and change in the prison service. And I see some fantastic um, young prison officers who are just new to the job. I met them um, in McGabry who are making a real difference. And I think if we were in a position where we were better able to showcase the kind of work that they do, then I think it would definitely attract more interest in terms of people wanting to apply. Peter, I think you have obviously, um, I mean, you've been dealing with this issue with Ronnie even before I came into office, yeah. and I'm happy for you to kind well, of... Well, I just wanted to, to emphasise that the prison service, uh, and Ronnie and, and his colleagues are making huge efforts to try to uh, secure a more representative workforce. There is, um, in the last two or three years, the outreach that the prison service has done is well beyond anything that's ever happened before. And each time that there is a recruitment program, efforts are made to try to secure as big and wider base of applications as possible. I agree with the Minister that you know, we're always open to uh, suggestions about things that we aren't doing that we, we should think about doing. And if you or your party have those, then I know Ronnie, uh, I and Ronnie would be happy to meet you to discuss uh, what they might be. Uh, but I just want to emphasise the level of effort that has already been put into this. Well, uh, I suppose the bottom line is uh, that uh, in this day and age, in any workforce, uh, least of all in the public service, that only 15% of the workforce should come from a Catholic background. That's unacceptable and something needs to be done about it. And you as Minister, the buck stops with you uh, and, and it's up to you to ensure that that changes. Because there are other problems in, in the, uh, in the prisons as well. I disagree that the buck stops with me in the sense that if there are societal issues, it requires a constructive political response from all of, all of us. There is something I can do in terms of leadership as Minister of Justice, but I can't remove all of the barriers in society to people wanting to join the prison service and serve as prison officers. I can set the tone for that and I can support Ronnie and his colleagues and what they're doing in terms of outreach and encouraging people to come forward. But if there are societal barriers to people coming forward, then I need the cooperation of others, including yourself, your colleagues and others around the table, to be able to tackle those societal issues. Because at the end of the day, I am the Minister for Justice, but I don't have a magic wand to completely change society. And we can put in place the right mechanisms. But again, there's no point in approaching this from a mechanistic point of view, unless we know the reasons why the percentages are low. Is it low application or is it low success at appointment? If it's low levels of application, then we need to look at why do people not apply to be prison officers? What is the thing that is stopping people coming forward? Is it that they feel that that job is high risk? Is it they feel that that job is not fulfilling? Is it they feel that that job is not something that is appropriate or would be respected um, where, where they live? I, we need to look at that, and I think we need an evidence base 
um, in order to be able then to make the decisions. But I think the first point um, well, in terms it's of possible. access. Prime Minister, when an analysis should have already been done on that type of information. Well, I can't answer for anything before six weeks ago, in fairness. There will be plenty of evidence about the levels of application and so on, which we can provide to the committee. But I mean, there are other problems within the prisons, uh, and uh, a relatively recent CJA report stated that a disproportionate number of Catholic prisoners were facing disciplinary sanctions within the prison. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that's the result of the, the imbalance in the workforce, but it's certainly something that should be investigated. And that in itself, if, the, if, the, if there are problems with the imbalance in the workforce, that in itself may be an obstacle to people from certain backgrounds joining the prison service. And, well, you know, it, uh, wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on that in terms of the, the if you like, the operational issue. But certainly in terms of the CJI reports, I mean, those are taken seriously and will be looked at, um, both in terms of the prison service and the department. Um, and in terms of any changes or assessments that need to be made. Um, but I'm glad that you're not jumping to the conclusion um, that the reason um, for that disparity is either discrimination or um, the imbalance in the workforce, because I think that that would be a bit of a leap um, in the dark um, and wouldn't necessarily be based and on And that's why I'm not and doing it. Exactly. But, but you certainly can't rule out unconscious bias um, in a situation like that. Perhaps I could just add, though, um, a piece of information for the benefit of the committee. So, um, Ronnie Armour commissioned a piece of work to look into that very issue, and um, a report was completed that drew out um, a range of quite complex uh, issues which go well beyond the simplistic uh, headline that you refer to. And we would be happy to provide the committee with a copy of that report so uh, you, you can explore that and, if necessary, hear in more detail from uh, Ronnie and his colleagues about uh, the work that they've been doing. Okay. Thanks for that. Minister, we have two more people have indicated to speak. I'm conscious you've been here for coming on three hours. I don't quite have the, the bladder of the Speaker of the House of Commons, <laughs> Burko, who has a record, I think, of 13 hours without <laughs> leaving. But uh, I'm in your hands in the sense I'm happy to take a comfort break. Um, for five minutes, uh, but if you want to push on, there's two more members, um, and hopefully that might complete the session. So, if we could push on, I would appreciate it because I do have another engagement that I'm going to straight after committee. But um, yeah, well, I don't want to cause any discomfort to the chair in case you hold it against me later. No, 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 it's okay. I, I can push through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring in Doug. Hang on. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Minister, for, for, for your answer so far. Your very fulsome answer so far, I have to say, and, and, and thank you for having a, a steel bladder so we can get this done. <laughs> um, uh, but but I, I guess I'm really glad we are talking about the prison service. I mean, uh, you know, I think they do a fantastic job, and I do think sometimes they, they are a, a, a forgotten service. And it's not because of your department, but I think it's just the nature. Uh, of the, the job they do, um, and they do that fantastic job. But there, there, there is real issues um, that I see within uh, the prison service. Um, and I know that you take uh, mental health and well-being very, very seriously. I know the department does. I see your well-being programme for, from this week. Actually, I was reading through it. I wouldn't have minded attending some of those myself. So, so it, you do take it seriously. But I was absolutely aghast to find out that there's no records kept of those who leave the service through post-traumatic stress disorder um, or mental health illness. Um, and that really concerned me. And it concerned me to the stage that I did a bit of digging to find out that TMR, who are the medical health professionals who deal with the, the, um, the prison service, have stated that of the people they see, 80% of them have either got PTSD or are showing signs of PTSD. That's not just service members who have left, but those are ones who are still serving. Um, and having raised that issue, I have been inundated by many officers who have come to me to give me examples of some things that's going on. If I can, Minister, and afterwards, uh, I'm happy to, to pass this information on to you. But I have one officer who went sick with mental health issues, was diagnosed with PTSD, came back to work a number of months later, and received uh, official warning. Yet another guy who broke his ankle, who went off for the same length of time, came back and did not. 
So I think there is a fundamental issue within the service on how they deal with mental health issues and PTSD. Even the tool that they have for reporting sickness doesn't give the option to say, I have got PTSD. So therefore, there's two points to this question. Um, now, so one, your urgent review, can you extend that to reviewing the welfare system with those still serving and not those who have left? So we look at issues that I've just raised. And secondly, can you delve into the issue of prison officers who have been diagnosed with PTSD being given formal warnings for being absent because of that PTSD? Okay. Well, the first thing I would want to say is that I think that mental health is every bit as serious as physical health. And I think that the stigma that's often attached to mental health um, issues is not helped um, if there's seen to be any differential in terms of the treatment of those who have mental health issues um, and, and those who have physical health issues. So I think that that's absolutely clear. In terms of, um, for example, PRRT, actually serving prison officers do have access to that system, um, though I think its uptake is in rather small numbers. Um, they also, and I, when I was in McGabry, I spoke to prison officers about what support was available to them because it's something that I was interested to hear, given the context in which they're working and the pressures that they face. Um, and a number of them um, were clear that they had good support in terms of car call, which they had used um, in terms of things that they had seen or um, issues um, that had arisen where they felt that they needed to talk to someone um, independent of that. Um, and they generally said that they also felt comfortable talking to other officers for support, that they felt that there was good peer support um, in terms of the work that they did. But I will certainly take a look um, in terms of, of the, if you like, what the landscape um, for supporting um, current present officers is. In terms of widening the scope of the review, because the review, I want to get it done quickly. Um, I think if I widen the scope of it, then it becomes a, a bit of a, a curate's egg with lots of different bits going in different directions. And I think there's a, there's a risk that you end up losing focus and it won't be done in time. So I'm very keen to try and keep that very focused, but I'm happy to take alongside that, um, have the conversation again, because I have already had a conversation um, with Ronnie Armour about the need to ensure that prison officers um, in their role are properly supported. As I say, on the day that I visited, the people I spoke to um, seemed highly motivated, um, seemed to believe that there was good support for them. But I'm more than happy to sit down with you. And if you have cases or concerns, then we can take those up and pass them on um, to, to Ronnie and deal with them. Because it is important um, that people who face, I think, quite challenging circumstances, working with quite difficult groups of people, um, some of whom themselves, um, have serious mental health um, and substance abuse issues when they arrive in the prison system, um, and others um, who, you know, may be threatening and intimidating officers and so on. Um, I think that there are issues around trying to ensure that they are protected um, and that they do get the right level of support. And I'm happy um, if you want to bring any issues that you have. Um, and we can look into those and try and get you an answer. Thank, thanks, Minister. And, and, I, and I understand why you can't uh, sure. expand it. Abso absolutely. I mean, and I guess the, the, the problem is you cannot differentiate between a psychological injury and a physical injury. No. And, and, and therefore, that question has to arrive. And if it's a deep-rooted issue that somebody is coming back from sick with a medical injury, gets a written warning, and somebody goes back with a physical injury, does not, then there is a fundamental problem there. But I'll, I'll provide you with the information on that if I can, uh, Minister. Um, can I just? Ju I'm jumping around a little bit here. I hope you don't mind. But but I've raised this issue with you before, but I'm going to raise it again because I have real concerns about legal aid. Um, I have real concerns about legal aid for the cost of legal aid. Um, I think we need to make sure we have legal aid. I think it needs to be targeted at the right people. Um, up till 2016, um, legal aid was running at about 100 uh, million pounds uh, a year. Uh, the Public Account Committee sat, they, they brought forward some recommendations. There was a reduction in legal aid down, I think, 2018 to about £65 million. Pounds, uh, and then last year, it was £84 million pounds for legal aid. But every single time, the accounts are qualified. And they are qualified through fraud and error. Now, at what stage 
Because when somebody says to me fraud, I think illegality. And is that illegality from the person who receives the service? Or is that an illegality from the person who's providing the service? But regardless, how many years of reports do we have to have which says fraud before we say enough is enough, it's time the police come in to look at this fraud? Well, I think there are a few things I would want to say. I mean, first of all, I agree that it is important that legal aid reform, um, the work that has been undertaken has reduced the bill, um, but hopefully we still have ensure we're still, if you like, fulfilling the requirement of ensuring access to justice, um, because I think that that's absolutely crucial. Um, We've already done quite a bit of work um, and we're obviously looking for new opportunities to be able to continue that reform. Um, so, for example, standardisation of legal fees in a number of areas is one way forward. There's also the introduction um, of the legal aid management system, the, the computerised system, which again should um, deal with some of the issues that you've raised. But where are or um, mistakes or whatever it might be or, or fraud um, are, are suspected or determined. I mean, full investigations will be undertaken um, because it's not something that is taken lightly. It's public money and it has to be accounted for. Um, I think there can be issues. Um, I think there can be issues of genuine error and I, don't, I think it's important we don't conflate those. Um, but I, I do think that with the with the LAM system being in place, that should help. Um, and the more standardisation there is, the, the simpler that the system should become in theory anyway, uh, which should drive that down. Um, but I know that the issue of that report was, was prior to my time. So yeah. uh, again, I'm going to let Peter maybe respond on the specific issue around the accounts, because I know that the PAC has been very active on this. Um, and we've received a number of questions around um, how we're fulfilling the requirements um, from the PAC um, recommendations and also, as I say, ensuring good value for money, but also clear and accountable, um, uh, clear and accountable um, reports on resource. So you're absolutely right that, that the accounts uh, first in, initially of the Department, uh, the Department of Justice and more recently of the Legal Services Agency have been qualified for a number of years on, on the basis of fraud and error. We've been undertaking a sustained program of work, working with the Northern Ireland Audit Office and others to make sure that there's full transparency uh, to try to reduce um, that level of fraud and error. And the reason that the department's accounts are no longer qualified and only the agency's accounts are qualified is that we are making some progress uh, along that route. Among the things that we have done is to engage a team from the Department for Communities who deal with the same set of issues around fraud and error in relation to benefits payments, in relation to legal aid, to apply the same rigour of approach. Because one of the significant problems um, and reasons why the fraud and error number looks so large in the accounts is because the audit office are telling us that they cannot verify whether or not everything has been done correctly to their satisfaction. It's not that they are identifying and proving fraud in uh, the, 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 to the scale that they are putting into the, uh, the accounts every year. It is that they cannot disprove that there is fraud. So we need to go through a process to try to disprove the fraud. And you, you'll understand that's a much more difficult thing to do than it is when you've identified a fraud and you then need to act on it. So um, I cannot, uh, uh, with, with honesty, say that it is likely that that qualification on the agency's accounts will be lifted this year. But there is a very substantial programme of work, and I can, we can write to the committee and set out the steps that are being taken to address uh, fraud and error is a high priority within the department. Uh, I and my senior colleagues spend a lot of time looking at these issues to try to uh, make sure that we're doing all that we can to make progress. Thank, thanks, Peter. And, and, and I know you're working on it. I absolutely know. And I've asked um, the Minister a question before, and, she, and you've been very open on this. But, it, but I've got to say, as long as that word is still there, as long as the people out there are seeing that within the government department saying that there is... There is fraud, and remember it says fraud and error, not fraud, error, fraud and error, so but, the fraud piece. But, but it's not, to be clear, saying that, that, the, um, that there is fraud, they're saying that they cannot disprove that there is not fraud. Yeah, well, well, yeah exactly, so they're not saying it is fraud, but they're not saying it's not. <laughs> you know, um, so, so I guess the problem is, when do we, when do we draw the line? You know, I, I get that this year it'll probably still say the same thing, 
What about next year if it still says the same thing? You know, we have to. Well, that will be a judgment made by the audit well, office some, on, the, some, on the qualification of the Some along the line we have to address it because any other. But it is being addressed. That's the point I'm making. Each other, year we are getting a but better other department, asset. But any other department, Peter, that had this appearing in it time and time again would be would be held to account. Um, and, and all I'm doing. And I'm happy is, to be held to account. Setting, and, up, setting that marker down um, because we do need to. Can I just move on, um, please, to um, victims commissioners? And again, it's something which is really important to me, and I'm, I'm thinking about. The, the, the victims of crime throughout Northern Ireland. Uh, and right now we have a, a, a victims commissioner who deals with troubles related crime. Uh, and I know, and quite rightly, that those who uh, are victims of historical institutional abuse may well want to be getting their own commissioner and they may be lobbying for their own commissioner. And you may find that those who um, are, are, have been affected by domestic abuse may be well um, looking for their own commissioner as well. Is it not time that we got in line with what England and Wales has, and had a victims commissioner that covers all victims, um, past, present, and future victims. Um, because if we don't, we're differentiating between victims from our past um, and victims from our present. Well, I think there are a couple of things just before I kind of answer the, the specific. The first thing is that in England and Wales, they actually do have a victims uh, domestic violence commissioner so I mean there are bespoke commissioners for different things um, it's not a route um, that I would be minded to go down at this point and haven't met recently um, for example with women's aid um, we had the conversation about trying to identify what is the gap that they would see that commissioner filling we know that in England and Wales for example that the victims commissioner part of the reason that they're there is because you have um, a large number um, of uh, police uh, police services um, to cooperate. You have boundaries between them and different um, series of justice, um, different arms of the justice system. You will also have other services that are provided at district council um, and 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 so on. We have more unitary authorities here, with the result that there's less argument if you like less of a strong argument um, for having a victims commissioner per se but look no final decision has been taken on with respect to having a victims commissioner overall um, I'm obviously intending um, to meet there are a number of victims who have raised this issue um, about potentially um, the usefulness of a victims commissioner um, for wider groups of crime I think again the question I would ask as I did around having a domestic violence, a commissioner for domestic violence is what is the perceived gap that needs to be filled and is that the best use of the money? So for example in the case of the domestic violence situation um, the model that was used in England and Wales could cost up to a million pounds in the Northern Ireland context per year. The question then is, is that money better invested in other services? Is there a different way of doing it by having a champion who keeps that alive as an issue, but perhaps the money is, is better invested elsewhere? So I think that there are a number of issues that we would have to look at um, in terms of whether or not that's something that locally uh, we would need, given just the size and the structure of support. We do fund um, victim support, um, obviously, to provide a range of services for all victims. Um, of crime and part of their remit does include representing and advocating on behalf of the interests of victims of crime and shaping policy decisions um, through the different policy forums. So it's not that if you like nothing is being done, nor should we assume that the presence of a victims commissioner in England and Wales necessarily produces better outcomes um, than the, the, the mechanisms that we have here. But I'm happy um, to, if you have particular representations or issues, I'm happy to consider those because, as I say, but I would want to come to it from the perspective of saying what is the gap currently that needs to be filled? What is it that victims who are going through the system at the moment are not able to access that having a commissioner in place would make more accessible? And is it good value for money in the sense that would, if we had that money, would it be better invested directly in services and provision, for example, through victim support? Or is it better in establishing a victims commissioner? So I suppose that's that's the challenge in terms of trying to work out what this is. In terms of the wider issue about the the victims commissioner, in terms of, of historic um, issues, I mean obviously that, that that's something that's not within my remit, so I can't comment obviously on that particular issue. 
And I wasn't particular on, on that one either, and I, and I wasn't saying we shouldn't have others. I was thinking more that if you had one for all, uh, and, and there's a money saving to be in there as well to, to give money for, for another service, but thank you for that. Could, could I just ask a very quick question? <clears throat> um, the 2.5% that went to PSNI officers for their pay rise, did that also go to other staff in the PSNI? Or was it just for PSNI officers? No, the, the police staff remit will be dealt with separately. Yeah. So that'll be subject uh, to a separate pay yeah. remit. That's a civil service, yeah. yeah. It, it, well, it'll come through from the PSNI. They'll, they'll, yeah. they'll put the pay remit through for their police staff. Right, so, so sorry, let me just, absolutely right. So the 2.5% went to uniformed police officers only, not to any of their support staff? Yes. That's right. Correct. Okay. Uh, another quick fire one, if I can, please. Um, uh, Peter, we talked about this uh, in our dry period when we had no executive. Um, PMOs, um, we talked about uh, the probation board possibly handing them over. Um, to back to the PSNI, is that still on the cards? Is it still a discussion, or has that been put to bed? So, this, this is terrorist-related offenders, yeah. uh, and um, there at the moment there is um, there's a new assessment tool being developed um, for the management um, of terrorist offenders and the assessment of terrorist offenders. Um, and that's something that we are looking at um, in the department. It's being developed um, in England and Wales um, as part of the Ministry of Justice. Um, it's something that we think may be useful in terms of assessing um, how best to manage um, terrorist offenders, because obviously there are challenges in terms of, of how that should be done and getting consistency on that. So that's that's currently being considered. In terms of the current management, um, there is there is a structure in place to ensure uh, that people are properly managed. Um, but I think it would be fair to say that this new tool is not something that would necessarily lend itself to use by probation board. So it may be that a new structure is required in order to implement um, the use of it because it would look at terrorist offenders um, through a different lens because obviously in terms of rehabilitation and other things there are challenges um, around how effective that can be in some of those cases so it's still it's still under consideration um, but will be coming back to the committee um, probably reasonably soon um, with a bit more information okay thank you thank you um, thank you uh, Rachel um, thank you and uh, thank you mr. for attending today a number of my questions have already been brought up so there's only three that I have so we'll get you away quickly um, I'm wondering if you have any update on the review of anti-social behaviour legislation and any intention for movement on it, particularly in um, with regard to public space protection orders, fixed penalties and seizure powers? Um, I don't... Um, I mean, I got a, I got a briefing um, on this um, yesterday, in, specifically in the context um, of kind of upcoming anticipated difficulties um, in, in some places um, around um, St Patrick's Day. Uh, I'll say festivities for want of a better description. Um, and so I'm aware that there has been some consideration given. As you know, the original um, the original legislation, which allowed, for example, for the seizure of um, open containers of alcohol and so on, hasn't actually been commenced. and. It, legal advice now would suggest that if it were, it would actually give the police the powers that were hoped for. Um, so we're currently working to look at alternative mechanisms um, of doing that through council bylaws, um, as opposed to actually going down the legislative route. Um, in terms of David Ford, when he was minister, already had introduced the fixed penalty scheme that allowed um, people to get fixed penalty fines <coughs> for those issues. In terms of antisocial behaviour orders, very few, I mean, I, do, I can't recall um, off the top of my head the numbers, but very few are actually used um, in Northern Ireland because actually um, the level of activity that is viewed as antisocial behaviour here tends to fall below the threshold that would be required for an antisocial behaviour order to be issued or you know, be sought by the police. In terms of um, antisocial behaviour, the trend has been downwards and actually the majority of the respondents to, I think, the survey, the, the main issues that they were identifying as 
antisocial behaviour actually fell into nuisance behaviour, like littering, um, noise, um, and things that wouldn't have been antisocial in the sense of, of reaching the criminal threshold. But I can write to you in a bit more detail because um, it's something to say I was uh, just kind of reading through quickly yesterday. Um, but it was it was reasonably clear around the the alcohol approach that would be taken would be working alongside councils around bylaws. Um, also, the fact that the penalty notices were there. And as I say, I don't think antisocial behaviour orders in terms of Northern Ireland have have had significant impact, let's put it that way, um, in terms of how many of them have actually been sought. I mean, it was single digits, um, so if even that in some years. So um, I think it's more about trying to work to reduce what is um, the kind of, I, I think it used to be unfairly referred to as use cause and annoyance, but actually it's, it's not that simple. Um, some of it is just people hanging around and they're not actually doing anything other than hanging around um, and I think that some of those issues are ones that are more for kind of youth diversion. We're also conscious um, in terms of the Youth Justice Agency and others about early interventions where those groups of young people who are hanging around not doing anything wrong um, but perhaps having negative experiences interfacing with the police or with community or whatever it might be, um, that it's important to try to engage with them positively so that they're diverted away from any negative engagements with the justice system because they can often be vulnerable um, to either um, kind of coercive behaviour from people within the community um, or alternatively to those who would be seeking to get them involved in drugs, paramilitary activity or other criminality. So it's important that people <coughs> engage constructively with them and I think that there, I think youth services generally need to engage positively with young people um, to create a sense of place. But actually it, it seems to be a decreasing problem rather than an increasing one. Um, and I think maybe it's just because young people now um, are more entertained by their phones and at home um, than they are about hanging around the streets um, as they were <coughs> in the past. Um, I think it's just the culture perhaps has changed as well. Um, but as I say, the, 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 the largest number of people who were complaining about issues that they viewed as antisocial and are antisocial in the, in the most kind of common parlance sense um, were things like litter, noise, <coughs> and that kind of stuff, as opposed to antisocial behaviour in the criminal sense. No, thank you, and I appreciate that. And I would, would certainly welcome working along with you in terms of the youth focus. But for me, antisocial behaviour is not young people. Correct. I see more antisocial behaviour falling out of the pubs at the weekend than Absolutely. I do with the young people in our communities. And I think there needs to be a wider Agreed. conversation about how we view. Uh, young people and their behaviour because they're not actually doing anything wrong. It might be somebody else's perception that needs worked on rather than the focus on the young person. Um, in terms of, <coughs> we obviously have a growing health problem with regard to addiction um, and certainly with illegal um, illicit drugs as well. And we do, as we've been saying, need more joined up working on policies and, and projects to deal with that at kind of all levels of society, you know, local and overarching. So I'm just wondering, has there been any conversation or if you've any minded to have any with the, with the Department of Health and the Minister there about exploring options on safe consumption rooms and drug decriminalisation? Well, in terms of decriminalisation, it's a reserve matter. So <clears throat> that's a decision that has to be taken um, by Westminster. Um, in terms of um, things like safe consumption rooms um, and so on, um, it is an issue that I haven't spoken directly to the health minister about, but I'm aware that there's a drugs, um, there's a high level drugs meeting taking place in Glasgow, which both he and I were intending um, to be at, but unfortunately there was a clash in terms of diary. He's still attending and we're sending an official from justice, uh, which will be looking at some of those issues. I've had the conversation, obviously, I'm, as, I'm aware as everybody else is around um, the kind of drugs issues. I've had the conversation with the police and with others in Belfast around, um, for example, things like needle exchanges and so on. Um, and by and large, um, I think the issue is around, it requires the police um, to deal with, if you like, the increase in acquisitive crime that tends to happen around those centres, um, because people obviously still need to 
make money to get their drugs, particularly where we're dealing with illegal drugs. Um, and so there are challenges around that, and particularly I think if you have safe injecting spaces and things like that, you need to bring in, if you like, the policing around that and the, the other kind of mechanisms around that to make sure that it's a safe place. Some of the other developments that I'm aware of and that I've kind of I've sought some briefing on, though I haven't received um, as yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to be briefed the, uh, shortly, um, are things like um, the use of naloxone um, as a as an opportunity to be able to um, for first responders to be able to administer to people who are in a position where they're overdosing, um, and I think that that now being available as a nasal spray rather than an injectable means that it's more likely um, to be able to be used by first responders who are not medically qualified. Um, I know that there are pilots um, in both Glasgow and I think in Cardiff um, about delivering it via police officers um, and dealing with that. Um, I think the increase um, in drugs deaths um, is something that obviously should be of concern to everybody. I think that we need to be cautious, however, because it's not necessarily that the drugs taken are different um, in terms of what people are consuming, but it's um, it's poly drug use, um, often mixed with alcohol, um, that has led to the increase um, in deaths. And so I think that there are things that we need to do. And I've spoken to the health minister um, specifically around early intervention, um, because I think that if we can look at young people who are at risk, um, of, of ending up on drugs, of being lured or groomed by people who are selling drugs um, and try to deal with whatever issues um, are going on in those communities to try and resolve those issues um, and divert young people away from that. It's, it's much easier to do um, and much more effective than actually treating the problem once it all has already occurred. And I think both the health minister um, and myself would agree in terms of early intervention, whether it's on mental health or whether it's on drug misuse and abuse. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that whilst there is a certain in intensity of focus on the issue of illicit drugs, um, there are also issues about misuse of prescription medication and misuse of alcohol. And actually, that's the most prevalently abused drug in society um, and has long term consequences, which have knock on effects in places like domestic violence um, and domestic abuse situations. Nine, I think about 90 percent of people um, who are arrested um, and will, will say that drugs or alcohol played some role um, in the crime that they're accused of committing. So there are real challenges um, in terms of trying to tackle early issues around drugs abuse um, and misuse and the complex interface that that can sometimes have with mental health and domestic violence and doing that as early as possible because I think the tragedy is that people end up in the justice system um, because of issues of either serious mental health issues which have led to drug abuse and misuse which have led to criminal behaviour, which leads them to be um, in custody um, rather than early treatment, which can divert them away from that experience. Um, and I think all of us as a society have failed if the first time people get the treatment and support they need um, is when they find themselves in custody. Um, so I would hope um, that that's something that we would be able to develop. I think from a very practical point of view about keeping people safe, it really matters in terms of people's sense of safety and security in their community. I also think from a very pragmatic point of view, it makes sense financially because actually it costs an awful lot more um, to have people either in hospital, um, on the streets, um, in a bad situation, um, or in our prisons um, being taken care of um, in the prison system. It costs a lot more to do that than it does to do the early intervention that can actually let them get on and, and lead a more productive um, life. Um, and just to, to reiterate, um, you're correct, it's not a young person's issue around. It's why I said I hate the phrase used causing annoyance because it, it was always being used. It, it's, it's, it, this is not a young person's problem either. Often people are groomed when they're younger to start onto drugs, but that journey can, it's often when they're much older um, that it actually starts to have a real impact in terms of their health, uh, in terms of their mental well-being, and also in terms of offended behaviour.
Thank you very much. I have one more question, uh, very briefly. I'm just wondering um, if you have any assessment on the current age of criminal responsibility? Um, I don't. I would imagine that this would fall into the, the category that we discussed earlier um, around issues which would be controversial and therefore a matter over which we would require um, agreement around the executive table. And I suspect that my own views on this may not necessarily chime with all of my colleagues around the executive table or indeed uh, around this table today. Um, but I would be concerned that the age of criminal responsibility it is a live debate and has been for many years. I'm concerned that um, I'm concerned at the moment um, that it is still quite low. Um, but I think we also need to take account of the evidence in other places um, where, you know, in terms of how that impacts on how people are handled um, within the justice system. I think, crucially, it's what happens to someone when they do come into contact with the justice system that really matters. Um, and so I think that, for example, when people end up um, in our care um, as teenagers um, or as young people, that every opportunity is made to rehabilitate them, regardless of the, the issues around criminal responsibility and whether or not they're old enough um, to understand fully the implications of their crime. I think most people would recognise that any person, any young person um, who finds themselves in that situation um, needs the support, the encouragement and the challenge um, to be able to turn their lives around because they have their whole life ahead of them and still the opportunity, I believe, to go out and lead productive lives and make a contribution to society. We know that some of the groups who are most at risk of offending um, are people who are, for example, excluded from school. So again, this isn't something that I think we can tackle on our own in terms of the Department of Justice. I think we need to, walk, we need to work cross-departmentally with education um, and with health. And that's one of the areas that I'm looking at in terms of, I think I mentioned in my original presentation about Lakewood, um, uh, and so on. I think it's important that we look um, at how we care for vulnerable young people. And I think young people who are offending um, are, are vulnerable too, um, as well as those um, who are victims of those crimes. And I think we need to look at it through that lens and how we actually turn their lives around so that they can be productive members of the community. Thank you. Last but not least, Linda just wants a final supplementary. I just want to have the final say. It actually is a theme that runs through everything that you've just, every single question from Pat's right through to, to, to Doug's and, and to Rachel's. And when you're talking about the young people and, and what needs to be done there around whether it's health and justice or education, the point I want to make, and I said it last week, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I don't care because I'm going to keep saying it. Youth service. The people who are most qualified to engage with young people, whether it's in the prisons or outside of them, are used service and they should be used by the PSNA, they should be used by the prison service, they should be used by every single level that is dealing with young people, whether it's going out to engage with, and, and obviously they already do a lot of that work, but I just think you cannot um, put enough emphasis on, on the requirement for that. I don't think anybody else engages with them in the same way. And even when you talk about the, the groups there that are most vulnerable, it's young people in care. It's looked after children who are probably the most vulnerable and youth services are definitely needed in engaging with them because they don't have a relationship with anybody. And I think I think that, that I think it's probably a good place to end the discussion today because at the end of the day, if we get early intervention right, if we can keep young people away from offended behaviour. But more than that, if we can work together on a cross-departmental basis um, to tackle some of the root causes of offending, um, which often come from slightly chaotic um, lifestyles um, that people are engaged in that can be very difficult for young children growing <coughs> up um, in those homes where there is domestic abuse, where there might be substance abuse um, and other things, they don't get the best start in life. If we can see those 
adverse childhood experiences and find ways of getting early intervention in place, we can reduce offending. And by reducing offending, we've reduced the number of victims, and that is what we want to do. If we want people to feel safe in our community, we want to reduce offending. And the best way to do that, from my point of view, is to try to deflect people away from the justice system so that they're actually living productive lives. And I think young people are a classic example where their lives are not completely formed. It is never too late to make a change, um, but particularly when you're talking about young people of 14, 15, 16, get their whole lives ahead of them. I think most of us are completely different people um, than we were when we were teenagers. I know I certainly am, and I'm, I, I'm, I'd say a lot of people are glad um, of that. I've mellowed, believe it or not, with age. Um, not everybody sees that side, no. but there you go. You should have known me when I was 14. Um, but the truth is that we've got to find ways of supporting and encouraging young people and getting the best out of them, because I think that's good for society, it's good for community, it's good for them. But it also reflects on what kind of a society we want to be. Um, and I think it's absolutely crucial that we engage with them. And I think young people in particular, um, there's an opportunity there. Um, to really change people's lives in a meaningful way um, and intergenerationally as well because then they go on to be more stable parents and, and, and so it goes on. Um, and I think if we can break that cycle of instability, it can make a massive difference in community. So I think it's a good place um, that we've ended, um, Chair, if you don't mind me saying. Um, and thank you. You've been very patient. I know it's been a long session, um, but hopefully it's been an informative one. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank three, you. Or, three hours, thank 20 you. minutes later, you've been very generous with your time, Minister. <laughs> So, uh, the committee's also been very generous, and thank you for that, and I appreciate it, and I look forward to working with you. And maybe next time a comment will be slightly shorter. <laughs> okay, thank you. Members, we're going to take a short comfort break. We'll reconvene in five minutes. Thank you. Ireland <laughs> Assembly Committee.